up guys i'm tristan i'm rob and we're here at tailwater outfitters at their brand new location doing a slow pitch digging seminar uh, we hope to see you guys here it's going to be a great one we're going to go through everything from rod selection reel selection jig selection show you some knots and then everything to the technique so that you guys can kind of figure you know kind of have an idea of what you're doing you know even if you don't want to go into it full 100 percent a lot of guys will just have a rod on board to add it to their quiver of stuff while they're bait fishing if it slows down the jig usually can fire back up, so we get started. You know, the cool part about this is we've had fish live bait so many times, it's not even a question. Unless we're absolutely unsure and the captain says, hey, listen, we haven't caught these things on jigs, we're going to bring bait just because. We'll go with the flow. You guys are the local experts. We're, we're relying on you. We maybe never fished with you before. We just met you. We've had a little bit of phone conversation. Maybe we've talked. Maybe a bunch of texts and traded some social media stuff. But we're relying on you as the, the local expert. Uh, literally, last year, we both flew into California. Tristan went for tuna, uh, doing the bluefin thing out of San Diego. I went for rockfish and bottom fish out of Long Beach. And literally, you're walking on a boat. I'm looking at a bunch of guys like you are right now. You're looking at me going, what's he bringing to the table? And how would you start? Well, how deep are we fishing? What's the current like? What's it look like? What's the bottom like? And what are these fish supposed to do? So with that, you know, you guys being the local expert, I mean, literally, you're on the boat. You're on the charter with us. You know the people you're fishing with. We don't. But still, we're, yeah. we're ready to show you what we got. And again, more times than not, it kind of shows out. You know, we'll go up there, like I said, go to those places like that. Guys predominantly fish bait, get on there with the jigs, and it's, it's lights out. After, this, after the, uh, the trip, everybody's, where can I get one of those setups? Everybody makes fun of you when you get on the boat. After the fact, it's, you know, everybody wants one. Um, so I guess let's get into what is slow pitch jigging. So pretty much what slow pitch jigging is is, you take a metal lure like this and impart action on it. And what you're trying to imitate is a dying bait fish. You know, speed jigging, those guys, you're trying to rip it through the water, imitating a fleeing bait fish. This imitates the dying bait fish and it gets, you know, a different type of fish a chance to get after these baits. You know, your big grouper and snapper and stuff, a lot of times don't want to come up off the bottom very far. So doing slow pitch jigging will allow these fish time to look at that bait coming down figure out what they want to do with it and make their reaction strike towards it, you know, as an easy, you know, easy prey. Um, they designed, or this is a Japanese technique, they brought it into, well, they started doing it because they realized that their heavy pressured fisheries over there in Japan, everybody fishing bait, you know, it's kind of like where we're from, you know, it's very, very pressured and guys fishing bait out there, the fish only want to see that bait so many times, but you bring something else new into it and now they're seeing something moving differently than they're used to, you know, it, it, it just brings out a different reaction from them and allows them to, you know, want to go after these baits and, you know, you get that strike. Um, so that's kind of, I guess, my interpretation on it or a lot of people's interpretation on it. I don't know if you had any other thing you wanted to add to yeah, that. I'll expand on that. Big difference between speed jig and slow jigging. You can, can you speed jig or slow pitch with a speed jig? Yes. Can you slow pitch with any rod you've got handy in the boat? Yes. With that said, it's the system that really makes this shine. The sensitivity, the light line, the direct, literally the direct connection to what's going on underwater. You'll feel that jig pop up, the rod tip will relax, and then it'll slack and slowly, it starts to gain a little, a little bit of tension in the line, and you're dropping that. While you're dropping, that jig's falling over. The big, uh, big difference between a speed jig and a slow pitch jig. Speed jig, typically uh, rear weighted and symmetrical. So when it falls, it just falls fast. The, your speed jig, you want the action to be imported on the way up, and again, it's a strictly reaction bite. Now, the slow pitch jigs, uh, we'll grab a prop. Slow pitch jigs, yes, looking at this, looking at the jig this way, it's symmetrical. Any which way you look at it after that, no. Is you can target a specific section of the water. I mean, everybody likes to pull on amber jacks. Everybody likes to catch any of the any of the other jack family friends in there when nothing's happening. 
With this technique, you can focus on those snappers, the groupers, uh, the African pompano, the, the, you know, the ones everybody wants in the boat. So what do we know about, what do we know about gags? They're up off the bottom. They're out hunting. They own that piece of property. They're typically the biggest thing next to a shark out there, unless you've got a, a, a goliath or, or a big black hanging around out there. But they're up off the bottom. Uh, the reds, the scamps, uh, the black grouper, they're typically hugging the bottom closer, looking for the tasty treats down below. And again, the gag's up top, and he could probably eat most anything that's hanging around down below him. So typically, you, know, you mentioned 60 feet of water, and yeah, we'll touch on some micro, some micro type applications and stuff that's gonna work out here for you. Uh, but the beautiful thing about the slow pitch is you could tailor it to what you need. Last weekend, I brought way too much stuff on the boat. I've, I had a wheelie cart full of stuff and then jig bags. The reason being, we started in 80 feet on the artificial reef, and then we wound up in 800 feet looking for tilefish, snowies, and yellow edge. So you've got to have everything in between to, to cover the applications you're looking for. And typically, you want to match either A, match the hatch, or B, you want a bigger presentation just to look for the bigger fish or there's bigger bait around. And then C, uh, you've got other factors, and we'll get into this shortly, uh, wind drift, tidal current, uh, split current, and then everything else in between. That was awesome. The rods, you know, mo mostly carbon, 99% carbon, most of them. Uh, you'll have hollow rods and you have solid rods. Usually guys just getting into it, we like to kind of push them towards a solid rod because most of you guys bottom fishing, and it could not be, but a lot of guys that are bottom fishing or any other type of fishing, their first thing to do when they hook up is they want to start pulling on that fish. Slow pitch jigging is almost like the complete opposite of that. So we push people towards a solid rod to start when they're getting in. That way there's a lot of forgiveness. If they hook up on that fish, they can really pull on that rod and you know, have less of a chance of it breaking, as opposed to a hollow rod, which is gonna give you the most action on the jig and the most response. It's gonna, they're a little more sensitive. So you don't really wanna put them in your gut and you know, pull on them and whatnot. Um, the only thing I wanna talk about is the length of these rods. So you're gonna see between different companies are gonna vary. You know, some rods are gonna be five foot five, and you're gonna see some rods all the way up to eight foot. Um, each rod, each length, for the most part has, they have, when you're six foot and six six and under, I'd say, is your main slow pitch stuff. Anything past that, in my opinion, is your um, long fall technique, which we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, but most rods you're going to see, or that you're going to want to fish, probably in that six foot to about six six range. Um, reason being is when you're out there on the water, sometimes, at least for me, those longer rods make it a little bit more of a chore, you know, to jig those uh, those jigs. Um, think of it like, you know, if you're holding out, I don't know a stick or whatever it is, and you got something on the end of it, the longer it is away from you, the harder it is gonna to be to hold out. So if you have something a little shorter, it's gonna make that jig, it's gonna put less pressure on you and allow you to jig it a lot longer. And, you know, um, yeah. Okay. So, gentlemen, can't, can't get past taxes unless you're a politician. Can't get past being six feet under unless you've got some fountain of youth. And you can't defeat physics. So, 10 years plus ago, a group of folks in South Florida started looking into, and all did this independently of themselves, started looking into this slow pitch jigging. Now, we were all bait fishing, we were speed jigging, and we started seeing these videos come up in the YouTube feeds of slow pitch jigging. And there's an amazing amount of stuff you come up with if you translate slow pitch jig into slow pitch jerk in whatever local dialect you're looking for, whether it's Japanese, Chinese, some sort of Indonesian, some sort of Malaysian. But you need to translate, to search, you need to translate into whatever that language is you're looking. Or if you find one you like, I hate to say it, like and subscribe and the next, system, uh, the next available videos will pop up. Now, 10 years ago, there were no English translations, subtitles, anything. The guys in Japan doing this, the guys, I mean, they're, they're years ahead of us. 
They're fishing 900 feet of water with a, a 300 gram jig, uh, little tiny hooks and they're catching uh, various different uh, perches and, and bass and I mean literally delectable critters that they sell for hundreds of dollars a pound in their fish markets. And they're catching these things. So we're watching the video and it was just a matter of watching technique. Unless there were subtitles, I'm, I needed a translator. And that, that's just the way it was. But you get the point, you watch them, they drop. You see them engage, you see the, the rhythmic action start. Um, the philosophy is, as long as that jig is in the water, it's fishing. Even if you're holding it straight out in front of you, it's fishing. It's, I mean, and again, we'll talk about a pause in a few minutes where you're working the jig and then you just stop and let it hang. And you think about, okay, was that long enough? So was, you get slammed. Red grouper are infamous for that. Porgies are infamous for that. And tuna screaming that jig up and you stop it. And just as you're getting ready to start going again, it gets ripped out of your hands. Now, length, length and material. So we first got into this six foot three, six feet. Ah, way too short. I want seven. It's the, the trend now is getting down um, using Daiwa as an example. They came out with a five foot four. You're like, what? Was it five foot four or was it five foot eight? Five five. So five foot five. No, way too short. I can't do that. Leverage. The further you hang something away, the more work. Again, you're the fulcrum. You're literally the pivot point right here. The further away from you that thing is, you're working that much harder. Now, let's go to the extreme. 1,000 gram jig and 2,000 feet of water. Okay, great. First drop, yeah, no problem. I can do this again. And then you start scoping out and then you're reeling up six, seven, eight minutes without a fish. And you got to drop again. Now you're, again, you're dropping a two pound plus jig in 2,000 feet of water, hoping to get a bite. Now you drop five, six times and then you're looking over and going, should we go back in? <laughs> we don't go shallow or do something a little different? But as you learn, as you progress, everything evolves, you get that shorter rod. And using, using George's wife, Robin, the owner, the George and Robin uh, Polo own the company. Uh, after we found, well, going back to that previous slide, after we found the wreck fish, uh, George's and the missus and some friends went over to the Bahamas and came out of the Bahamas, shorter run, and fished. George gave the missus a five foot rod with an electric reel. I'm, I'm sorry, this is six, but gave the missus a proto five foot rod with the electric reel. She fished and she's, she's gonna be mad at me. She's probably 118 pounds. Soaking wet. She's, she's gonna be mad at me. Uh, she fished all day in over a thousand feet of water between, with between 550 grams and a thousand grams. She wouldn't give the rod back, but she caught her, she, uh, she, had, she had a wreck fish like that. She had two palm frets and some queen snappers. I mean, that's all bucket list fish for us. And the missus goes out and, oh wait, you don't have one of these? Oh, here, you, you wanna, you, I hooked them, you wanna reel them up? So <laughs> they, yeah, yeah. <laughs> think about that. So second, second part of this, carbon fiber. Arguably one of the most advanced textiles, for lack of a better term, yeah. uh, that we've produced. Uh, lightweight, strong, responsive. Now, uh, let's go to the next one. So, most of these rods are parabolic. And what's that mean to you? With a rod, you've got two essential rod actions and then everything in between. You've got a full parabolic rod. You got one of the zeros. You've got a full parabolic rod See, we'll put, some, we'll put a little drag on that, but with this rod, you'll feel the entire rod flex through the butt. And you'll, you'll feel it's alive. That's, while this is a fast action parabolic rod, it's still parabolic. Now, every rod in this, in this particular category, and this is the tributes, uh, the tributes, you'll feel them flex all through the rod. The entire rod's working. Now, 
with the saying it properly, it's slow jerk technique. You're importing action into the lure via the reel handle. You're not pumping the rod, that's getting into long fall or high pitch. Uh, you're using the reel to impart most of the action in the rod until you try to get into uh, some sort of like speed jigging action. Now, uh, actually go back, I'll go back to that one more. So, hollow versus solid. Now, Carbon fiber is in all of the rods, and this is, this is nothing new. Uh, I remember when the first graphite bass rods hit the market for, the, for tournament bass fishing in the 80s, not dating myself. Uh, but then the, the ugly stick pops up, and next thing you know, you get, a, uh, you get an advertisement where the rod tip is meeting the butt. That was straight e-glass with a solid tip. Yeah. Take that e-glass, take that fiberglass and mix a little bit into the carbon fiber and each manufacturer has the ability to cater to his own needs. Now, they, they talk about modulus in the carbon fiber, high, uh, high modulus carbon fiber. The higher the number, the lighter weight the product is, the purer it is, but then again, there's also some issues that come with that. Uh, it, it, and it's crack then snap. Literally, you, know, you do something, you, Fiberglass is very forgiving. You know, we've been making uh, anything from antennas to fishing rods to airplanes, whatever it winds up being. And it's just by changing the, com uh, the composite of the material and how it's actually manufactured. These rods now, they're, uh, it it's traditional rods are built around a mandrel. So you get a uh, stainless steel tube, you wrap uh, material under pressure around that mandrel with that's uh, it's got some sort of adhesive, epoxy, resin uh, baked into it. Uh, traditional, uh, they were heated and cooked. Uh, those techniques changed a little bit. They went from heated and cooked to heated and cooked under either extreme pressure or under extreme vacuum. And that caused, that caused the resins to permeate the, the fibers and make a more, make a more, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, uh, more you know, infused product. Now, it, that got rid of some of the impurities in the rods. You know, when you buy a brand new rod, uh, or you have a brand new rod built, typically if there's, if there's a manufacturer's defect in that rod, you're gonna know the first time out, the first time you either go to cast it, or the first time you hook up on a fish. If, there's, if something's gonna go wrong with that rod and it's a manufacturer's defect, that's when it's gonna happen. Car doors don't count, 90 degree turns don't count, uh, but that's when you're going to see it. So the reason I put uh, hollow versus solid, solid was the original technology for building fishing rods. Uh, I don't know if you, I don't know if you remember the, the original bass rods with the little cork handle and the, the form seats and it five foot of solid uh, glass. You maybe, maybe you still have a couple in the house. I, I know I still have a couple in the house as collector's items. The technology is such that we went from the hollow, we're getting into the solid because we've refined the, tech, the, the manufacturing process of the solids to make them start performing like the hollows without the breakage issue. And we'll get into that in a little bit on, in the fighting techniques, but the solid blanks are out there. Um, one of the bigger names as far as solids as a, as a beginner rod right now is Goofish. They popped up on the market, they're solid, they're almost impossible to break. Can you break them? Yes. But at, outside of getting into a high stick and holding the rod you know, past 90 degrees, they're very forgiving. The hollows, you can't do that. No, no way, shape, or form, there's no hollow rod out on the, out on the market that's gonna do that. If, um, even, even, uh, even getting into the Pump Like a Man, the uh, Hardy Rise. the Hardy Rise series, you know, they were the first ones to refine a solid rod for the purpose of slow pitch jigging. Do, uh, do they fish well? Yes. Do they perform in some conditions versus others? Yes. The, but what we really just want to point out is the materials are out there, it's ever evolving, and the products are just getting better. You know, can you get into a, a beginner level rod, uh, v much more forgiving? Uh, stronger, stronger to the butt, yes. Um, 
there are a couple manufacturers right now. Uh, we'll, 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 get, we'll touch it on fish fighting here in a little bit. But a couple of manufacturers are looking for industry specific things. The California guys want a longer rod that they can party boat fish and actually rail it on a, on a rod. You know, uh, going back 30 years, those guys uh, pioneered the long range fishing with stand up rods. You know, five foot, five foot five, five foot six foot rods that they could fish 20 and 30 pounds of drag on to beat the big tunas. That went away. They went back to a more traditional style, a seven foot rod that they could pitch a bait with and then into the fighting belts. That refined down to, we're gonna reinforce the butt section and the front foregrip, and we're just gonna use the rail of the boat as a lever to pump the fish up and just rock back and forth using your body weight to work that fish back into the boat. So, specific techniques for specific things. It's out there and, and those tech, those, that tech does cross pollinate between the, between, through the, throughout the industry. Uh, got everything covered there? Pretty much. Let's talk about reels. This is, besides the rod, going to be your next most important part of this whole system. Uh, me and Rob like to use accurates. Everybody's going to have their own personal preference. You can fish accurates, you can fish Shimano Osa jiggers. If you want to just start out, you can fish Shimano Torium, um, anything like that. The key point is you want to have a reel that's going to hold about 500 yards of PE3 or what we call 30 pound braid. Um, 500 yards and at least put out around 20 pounds of drag. Um, drag is kind of super important in this. Everybody you're going to talk to as well will say a little, few different things about how much drag you should set your reels at. Um, I prefer lever drag because I can set my drag at it and I can go back and forth without having to worry about messing with a star and wonder if I'm back where I need to be. Um, but ideally you want to set about 15 pounds of drag. Um, some guys fish a little more. Rob's fish is a little bit heavier drag. Other guys are gonna fish a little bit lighter drag and use their thumb and their index finger to kind of control the spool when you know fish is uh, taking line out. Um, when we're grouper fishing, uh, usually I like to set my drags a lot higher because you know, these fish are gonna hit it and they're, they're diving straight for structure. You wanna be able to stop them. And if you're messing around with little light drag and whatnot, there's a good chance you're gonna miss these fish. Um, another important part is inches per turn. I think that's probably the most important part of all this besides the capacity. You want a row that can do at least 36 inches or three foot. Because like you said before, that's how you put in the action on these jigs. So um, for instance, <clears throat> say you're moving this jig, whatnot. Um, when you pull up and you let that jig fall down, the <clears throat> Um, to pull the slack out quick enough so you can get into your next, you know, your next pitch, you need to be able to pick up as much of that line as you can to, you know, get into your next pitch without, you know, uh, fouling up or anything like that. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I lost myself. No worries, no worries, no worries. I got you. All right, so what happens when you're slow pitch jerking? Uh, or long falling or high pitch. The reel is for the most part imparting the action into the jig. One turn with that 500 narrow, I know there's roughly 48 inches of line being recovered with one turn. Now, you put a hard snap on that reel, that jig immediately pops up, the rod loads, pops the jig up, and then the rod recovers, and that jig does what it does underneath. Now, it typically, it'll pop into where it's gonna go. Um, it'll give you a momentary pause before it starts to fall, and then it's gonna start to fall. You're gonna control that based on how much line you, how much line you recover and how quickly you recover it. So, biggest thing I want you to take away from this. Drag, with us, uh, we fish on the East Coast, Fort Lauderdale, most of our fish and yes, I've spent a lot of time out here, uh, anywhere from Pulley Ridge to the Middle Grounds up into Louisiana. Biggest thing is, if, the fish, if you're fishing around structure, be ready to pull that fish out. You need, to be, you need to have the drag, the drag needs to be smooth. We'll talk about line in a few minutes, but you need that capacity. Now, as far as bells and whistles, 
That depends on you and your pocketbook. We like the Accurates because of the, dra the weight of the reel. They're, the, they're one of the lightest reels on the market with one of the most powerful drag systems on the market for that kind of reel and for the price tag. You know, if you want the pens, you want the Avit, if, you, if you're a brand favorite, I was Shimano Pro Staff. I fished Toriums, I fished Trinidads, I fished the Osha Jiggers. Where I fish, those drags don't have, those reels don't put out enough drag. Literally, we're hooking fish right outside of their home turf and their first mission is get right back down. And I can't tell you how many times, hey, we're right over the airplane. We dropped, I dropped in. I literally felt the jig hit and drop in. And then I hooked up. I Game over. It was that quick. You know, uh, we found the, uh, the Valiant series, I don't know, eight or nine years ago, give or take. Phenomenal. But again, Benny Ortiz, if we're fishing light, he's probably fishing one of the small tranks because of the amount of drag they put out and he doesn't have to mess with the level one or with uh, leveling off the reel. He's running a level wine system. Uh, phenomenal little reel. Pick your favorite, learn your favorite, figure out what you like, figure out what you don't like. You can always upgrade later. And it, again, if you're just getting into it and you don't want to spend a whole lot of money and commit to it, buy something you could use for something else. We like the narrow spools because the line tends to come through the stripper guide and fall right into the middle of the reel. So you can focus more on the technique as opposed to worry about a guide that line across. Wider spool, um, again, using o the Osha Jiggers, uh, I've got a bunch of Talicas in the house. It's a much wider spool and you're gonna have to, you will have to spend some time, especially if you fish with a full spool, just guiding that line across so you don't, you don't choke the reel by bunching it all in the middle. I would say also the big thing about reels also is kind of what you're comfortable with. And then everybody has a little bit of comfort Everybody's hand size is different. So, you know, we might fish a 500 or we might fish something like a 300 in that shallower water. Still puts out just almost as much drag, still just as capable. Might be a little bit smaller, a little more ergonomic for your hands. Um, the other thing you might want to take a look at too is going with some of these reels that don't have an instant anti-reverse bearing. Instant anti-reverse. So that way, when, so when you're, when you're turning the handle, it doesn't click back, you know what I'm saying? So like these have instant anti-reverse. So when you're jigging, the, you know, when you're jigging, you don't have that annoying click back, which some guys might not mind, but most of us that are doing this, it's, it's just a little, I don't know, more of annoyance than anything. So not to say anything bad about the Avids, but an Avids are kind of one of the reels that'll do that. Now, a lot of guys fish the Avids and do well with them, but just, you know, it's something to look for. It's something if you're out there, you might fish them and you go, oh, you know what, I don't like that. Well, you know, a reel that has instant anti-reverse is, like I said, it's more of a comfort than it, than anything, but it's something to look at, so, you know, comfort-wise. So two types of manufacturing techniques for the reels. Uh, so the reel, the reel has to spin, go in one direction, and to make the drag work, you need to stop the reel spinning, go in the other direction to make the drag work and/or stop. Again, going back to that solid glass rod that you had in the, that you had in the cabinet or in the garage or Gramps' garage for, for us, uh, that probably had a, a little bait caster on it that was direct drive. And when you casted it, the reel spun uh, when it was, the line was going out. Well, you turn the handle, the reel spins when it's coming in as well. That was one-to-one. -one. It's old tech. It still it works. There's still a couple reels being manufactured sort of like that. But... Uh, two different manufacturing techniques to prevent the line from going out the wrong way towards the fish. You could use gears and, do and spring-loaded dogs, or they tried gravity-loaded dogs as well in some of the reels back in the day. So as that reel turns, whatever direction it is, that spring-loaded dog in some of the reels you hear them, they click, they they click, and literally as that as that little dog is ticking each one of the gears, that's the click, 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 click you hear as that dog's falling into the gear to lock it in place. Now, instantly reverse, different manufacturing technique. You're using one large bearing in here that the handle uh, the handle attaches to. 
Now, you turn that and it immediately, as you turn it, the instant anti reverse is exactly what it is. It's a one way bearing. So picture, picture coming off a, a ride at Disney. You walk through that little, uh, that little man gate and it only spins one way. It lets you out, but it won't let you come back in. Same concept. You know, again, get what you're comfortable with. I will say um, in, in some of the stuff I've read with uh, the Japanese angling, the philosophy there is buy the best you can the first time you can, treat it, respect it, love it, and it will be around for quite some time. And because it's close to the best you can get, you won't need to upgrade. Because you, going out and buying something a little more budget friendly, one of the pens, or uh, I'll pick, again, I'll pick on the Shimano. I love the Torium. The Torium's got the same guts in it as a Trinidad does. It's just a cheaper build on the outside. It's a phenomenal reel. It's also half the price of a, of a Trinidad or an Osha Jigger. So more than functional, it'll get you what you need and it's killed a lot of fish. Let's talk about line. So in this application, braided line is an absolute must. We're not fishing mono. We can't. You need to have. You need to be in tune with that jig, and the only way to do that is to fish a braided line that has virtually no no stretch. Um, the uh, biggest thing about these braided lines that we're fishing today is we kind of base it off diameter. Um, ideally, you want to fish as thin a diameter as you can get away with for what you're doing. So, how the Japanese rate their lines is through a PE rating. So you might have a PE two, two point five, PE three and I wouldn't go past a PE3. So PE3 would be like 30 pound, or 30 pounds, which if you see, you know, you put it on a braking machine, really breaks at 50 pounds, which is what PE3 technically stands for, is 50 pound braking strength. Um, most of what you guys are gonna be doing, what anybody does in slow fish jigging, we're fishing PE 2.5, which is 20 pound, PE3, which is or 30 pounds. And then you got the few that are gonna keep going lower and lower, the deeper we go, we're gonna fish maybe 15 pound, 10 pound, eight pound, you know, real, real light stuff because the water has a big influence on your line. So obviously the thinner that line is, the easier you're gonna be able to get down in deeper water or moving water. Um, another thing I wanna to touch on a little bit too is your leader size. It's kind of up to you for what you're fishing for. Um, I might fish 20 pound on my super light setups, 20 pound fluorocarbon leader. Um, you can fish mono. Ideally, you'd like to fish fluorocarbon because it has a little bit less stretch than the mono does. Uh, but like I said, I'll fish 20 on my really light stuff and you might fish 60, maybe even 80 when you're fishing really tight to structure for those big grouper. But most guys are gonna fish in that 40 to 50 pound range, which is usually adequate you know, for what you need to do. Um, you're gonna catch just as many fish. And at the end of the day, with this setup, I don't know, I, I've kind of seen it both ways, whether you're fishing 50 pound, you're fishing 80 pound, um, your leader wise, it starts rubbing on that, you know, on those rocks, it's gonna, it's gonna pop it either way. Um, <clears throat> you're gonna see a bunch of different uh, braid manufacturers out there. I'm not gonna tell you which one's better than the other. They're all pretty good, but there's something to keep in mind is a four carrier and eight carrier. So what I have on here is, for instance, J Braid 4. Uh, it's a four carrier line. They say that this will be a tad bit stronger than maybe say an eight carrier. Um, but then you have the eight carriers, which will be maybe a little bit more abrasion resistance. Um, I know Rob, he fishes a lot of different lines and he has one that he really likes a lot. Um, we even fish some of the fused lines too. So, you know, there's, there's a bunch of different lines out there, but really the important part is diameter. And then, you know, the, the strength of it at the end of the day. I mean, like I said, you're fishing a PE 2.5, which is 20 pound more than likely it breaks in that 40 pound range and then your PE3s are gonna break in that 50 pound range, which is more than enough because these reels aren't putting out 50 pounds of drag. So what we'd like to do is really push these lines to the limit because the technology is there in them to allow us to do so. Um, you know, fishing really light gear, but we're really, you know, when we get into the technique part of it, we'll talk a little bit more about how it works without blowing everything up. But uh, yeah, that's kind of what I have on the line. Um, I don't know, Rob, if you wanted to yeah. elaborate any, uh, any on it. So, uh, you, you guys all found this uh, this particular event via social media? Tried to counter. 
guy at the counter? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, me too. That's why they call me the secret squirrel. I have almost no social media presence. It's all forced. Yeah, catches uh, all the biggest fish, but I, nobody I, knows about it. Yeah, right. I, I, I'm, on, I'm on the boat with these guys. I typically wind up in the background. Uh, there's tons and tons of bragging pictures, somebody going like this, and I'm in the background. Um, I, I'm, uh, I'm old school. I don't. I really don't like it. when we're on when we're on the boat. My whole purpose of being on the boat is to catch more fish than you. I want to catch one more than you, if nothing else. I mean, granted, we all have our days, but I'm old school. Uh, it, it's me against you. And back in the day, it's we're on the boat. We're fishing for the pool. It's absolutely me and Dad or whoever I'm with against you. <laughs> and that's that's it. Here, I'm willing to share. You know. Uh, the PE rating, don't focus on that so much. It's actually, it's, actually the, uh, it's actually the official measurement to measure silk threads and their diameters. So that being said, it's like, wait a minute, time out. We're talking fishing, we're not doing textiles, are we? <laughs> um, I was with Shimano as a pro staffer when Shimano bought PowerPro. And because I could tie the knots that I could tie for the various fishing that I had, I had been doing at the time, I got stuck in the PowerPro booth as opposed to the Shimano booth or the Loomis booth. And I was the guy tying the knots. And it got to the point, I'd, because I was tying the knots, talking to you guys, my hands are doing whatever they're doing. Everybody's standing there, look, I'm talking, and everybody's looking going, what did he just do? And at that time, the biggest problem was taking that PowerPro, that braided line, and connecting it mono. And yes, I was that guy on a tuna boat where I put one of those tiny inline stainless swivels in as the connector between my braid and my leader. It was efficient, it was effective, but do you really want stainless steel going through your guides, especially under tension? No. Do you, I mean, do you even want to cast? Think about, think about that impact, that little, I mean, think about a BB hitting you. Anybody that's been shot with a BB, and boys will be boys. But I digress. Uh, what Tristan said, go with the thinnest line you could possibly fish. Get into the social media. Look, look at the various forums. There's hours of reading for discussion on pros and cons of each line, what one does better, what one does worse. Tristan talked about carriers. So each, this is all woven, unless it's fused, and in which case it's still woven but heated. To a certain extent. Or yeah. extruded. Now, the higher the number of carriers, chances are the thicker the line's going to be right off the bat. When you're talking eight carrier, 12 carrier, or hollow, you know, uh, a solid line, uh, uh, the J braids, the four and eight carrier, it's going to be much thinner than any one of the hollows. Now, each has a place, each has a purpose. Do the homework, do a little bit of searching, read the social, you'll find out there's various different, uh, there, there are a few blogs out there. Ray from Ray's Custom Works, he had just got into uh, a blog, I don't know if it's still up, but right. he had just started doing testing, break test, uh, actual true diameter test on the lines and was posting the findings. So the popular stuff, uh, Berkeley Crystal, Whiplash, uh, Yozuri Super Braid, uh, the J Braids, the four and eight, uh, and I, there's a ton of them out there. Focus, don't focus on the breaking strength. When Braid was brought to the US to overcome that little bit of a, a difference between the PE measurement and what we believed. At that time we were buying line uh, breaking class line. You fit, oh, we were fishing, we were fishing 10 pound tests. We were fishing 30 pound tests. We were, we were fishing 130 Dacron on unlimited rods. Don't focus on that with the PE. Do the homework, spend a few minutes looking around. Get the thinnest you can if you're looking for thin. If you're deep water, you want thin, you want capacity. If you guys are shallow, look for something that's rated for a little more abrasion resistance. You might have to fish a little heavier. Think about it. Uh, the drift, wind drift and tide, it's going to be constant. So there's always horizontal push, whether it's the boat dragging you away or whether it's the current pushing you away. 
there's always going to be some sort of horizontal drag you're going to scope. The thicker the line, the more resistance, the more it's going to scope. Fact. Again, back to physics. You, can't, you just can't beat it. Um, the Yozuri, uh, the Yozuri 20, the uh, Berkeley Crystal 14, uh, the J-Braid uh, 20, they're all rated, uh, like I said, there was a 14 and two 20s in that. All of those lines have tested and break somewhere between 38 and 42. The reason being, when the lines came to the U.S., uh, the manufacturers got together and said, hey, you know, this is way thinner than what these guys are normally used to. You know, they, they hand you a spool of line and they say it's 20, and then they, and then they backpedal a little bit and say, yeah, it's 20 pound braking strength with a diameter of six. Make sense? You guys you remember, you remember that when it first came in? But the actual braking strength on that, we're looking at some of the eights and tens, they're braking at 28 and 32. The 20s are breaking between 35 and I think the highest I saw was 42 or 44 pounds. Yep. You know, that's not 20 pound line. In my world, you're fishing a 50 pound setup. And with that, set your drag in <clears> accordance <throat> with, the line, with the line breaking strength. Now keep in mind, depending on how deep you're fishing, you're talking about 60 feet, we're talking anywhere from you know, out into 2,000 feet. Add that little bit of fluoro, you need the leader, it does not have to be 25 feet long. Add that little bit of leader and it gives you, it gives you a little bit of cushion. Literally, it's a shock leader. It's, um, the, um, the clarity of the line, spooky fish, uh, the, you know, using fluoro. Fluoro, the, uh, the level of clarity is the sa almost the same as water. So once it's wet, you can't see it, theoretically. Do, doing the same thing with mono. I mean, if you're fishing high vis, you got, and you got some, uh, you got some light running through it. I spent a lot of time growing up in the Northeast, chunking for tuna at night, and we we talked about the line being the same as uh, 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 a fiber, um, a fiber connection for communications. Or remember Light Bright? I don't know who's got kids, but you punch you punch that thing in, and that peg lights up. Well, I remember at night. Guys are fishing high-vis uh, high line or some of the, the copolymer stuff, and the, the light from the boat, you could see it running down the line into the water. The next question was, how far does that go? Now, with mono, yeah, uh, can you use mono as a leader? Yes, absolutely. Uh, especially with speed jigs, especially with dirty water. Don't be afraid. Experiment. What works for you in your conditions might not work for me, but somewhere in between, it all works. Uh, focus on, focus on your needs. This, this is, this is customizable. It, I'm fishing 20 pound J braid. I'm fishing 20 pound super braid. Uh, I'll go as far as saying when we get down to deeper water, then I love tilefish. I've been fishing for tilefish for, I don't know, 17 or 18 years now. It's typically 500 to 1300 feet of water. Uh, I won't say I was one of the first guys to jig them, but I was one of the first guys to consistently jig them. And we started off using 50 pound braid. That's because we just didn't know what we didn't know. Now on that little electric reel that's sitting back over there, uh, that's loaded with 15. That wreck fish that was in the picture a little while ago, that came up on that 15. And the biggest reason being that tide and the current. You guys are absolutely spoiled over here with your current or lack of it. You know, I, I've heard these guys, we, we hear the stories uh, out in a thousand feet of water fishing a 300 gram jig. And for, for a reference, uh, uh, 28 grams is an ounce. So that's 10 and a half ounces, give or take. If we, if we could fish 300 grams in a thousand feet of water, I'd, I'd never leave the east coast of Florida. I, I'd be fishing for the tile fish and everything else out in that deep water. But literally, we'll get out off the beach. Uh, some of the, sat, the Satfish apps, and there's a couple other out there, will show you what the current's doing with relation to the Gulf Stream. But literally, we fished one day, and it was two and a half knots. We went back out the next day, and it was 6.4 knots. Now, the guys I fish with, the guys we fish with, 
uh, that 20 pound Uzuri, that 20 pound J-Braid, that 20 pound Ultracast. That's about a staple yep. for, for all around for us. <clears throat> now, with that four and a half knots of current, 700 feet of line in the water, we're fishing a 500 gram jig. Uh, George started fishing uh, PE1, which is essentially 10 pound test. But again, without doing a break test, I've seen a bunch of PE1s that break between 22 and 28. So literally 20 pound line, but with a diameter of 0.1 millimeter. Now bump up to the 20 pound, that's getting into 0.23 millimeter. So think about that, 800 feet of line in the water with double the resistance. How much bottom time do you get? That with your drift, your current, that affects the amount of time your jig is in that, that location. I'll be the first one to tell you, Tile, golden tilefish really don't come off the bottom. Uh, typically your bite's between zero and six feet every now and again, and I, it absolutely surprised me when I've seen it. Uh, the goldens will come up 25 feet. You'll pop a jig off the bottom looking for a tuna or something, and all of a sudden you, 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 at that 25 feet, the jig turns over, you get bit, and it's a golden tile. Blue lines, they will come off the bottom. The snowies, the yellow edge, they will come off the bottom if they're not already suspended. Uh, we've had jigs, you're dropping a jig and all of a sudden it stops. That snowy was 25 or 30 feet off the bottom. So, point, point is, focus on the diameter you need for the application. We've, uh, we've actually been catching fish, catching fish well on that 10 or 15 pound line. You cut your jig off because you think maybe it's just that jig and you give it to the guy next to you. He ties that jig on, but because his line is twice the diameter, his bottom time is two or three bounces and then it's already floating in the, in the current and scoping out. So focus on your conditions, focus on your need. Uh, is there one right answer? No. Let's talk about connections. Does anybody here know how to tie an FG knot? Does anybody here know how to tie a PR knot? I'm sorry? Knot. Have you guys heard of either one of them? Yeah. Okay. So for this type of fishing, a little practice yeah, you can. <laughs> <laughs> this style of fishing, it's, you, you need to know how to tie one of those two knots. There's a couple of reasons. One, they're very strong. Uh, another one is you're using these little itty bitty guides and you put any knot really bigger than that, you're going to start snapping these guides back. You don't want that. Um, but talking about, I guess, let's talk about PR knots that I tie mostly. I know Rob likes the FG knot. I tie PR knot. Yes, I know it seems a little, you know, much. You got to use a whole tool to do it and whatnot. Um, it's almost 100% connection rate, you know, 100% connection. So, you know, if you're fishing that 20 pound or say 20 pound, which is breaking at 40 pound, and you're fishing a 50 pound liter, 40 pound liter, ideally, if you tie it correctly, you're going to get all that 40 pounds out of it rather than, you know, 20 pounds for, or even less for some knots, like a Albright knot, which a lot of guys like to tie, or a uni to uni or something like that. And again, those knots aren't gonna go through very smoothly, and they're, they're probably gonna be rebuilding re a rod after you know one or two drops. Um, the FG knot is just as good. Uh, like I said, I know Rob likes to tie it a lot. I tie it a lot too when I'm in a pinch. Um, it doesn't take much time to do either one of them. When I first started tying a PR, I was a little, you know, trying to get the hang of it. You know, you're not sure. Um, and when I would get out on the water, I'd get nervous and like ran a bite. I'm like, oh man, I don't have time to tie a PR knot. I'll just tie a quick FG and get on the water. Well, for me at least, I found that it's a lot quicker for me to tie a PR knot than it is an FG. Um, like I said, I know it seems a little, a little much, but it, it's, it's really worth it. Cause when you're out there you know, you're spending all this time, all this money to get out there, you know, 40, 50, 60, some of us even hundred miles and you're trying to catch these big fish, you don't want the reason why, because of a knot failure, something that you can control. You know, if a fish runs you in the bottom, that's, you know, fish runs you in the bottom, but if you can control stuff like this, like your knot, your terminal connections, your line-to-line -line connections, ideally, you want to have the best you can do, you know, to capitalize on what you're doing. Um, so these are two different tools that we would use to tie either knot. Now, which one? You don't need that to tie an FG knot, there's other ways to do it. This makes it a lot easier. You definitely need this to tie a PR knot. There's, there's no other way around it. 
Um, what this will do is, and if you guys want to stick around for a few minutes after, we'll show you how to tie either knot real quick. It's, it doesn't take long. But what a, ideal, what a PR knot is going to do is you're going to use the, you're going to run it through here, run your line through, put it on your leader so they're parallel with each other. You're going to roll it down one way and then roll it right back down, right over top of it. So you're rolling barrels right on top of each other. And what it's going to do, which is similar to the FG, is going to somewhat create like a Chinese finger trap. You know, when you put your fingers in there and it doesn't come out, it's the same idea with this. The harder you pull, the tighter it's going to go. Um, the FG knot is, is pretty similar. Uh, that one's more kind of cross hatching, which again, it does the same effect with the Chinese finger lock type deal. Um, so like I said, if you guys want to stick around, we can show you the PR knot. I don't know if Rob wants to touch on the uh, FG knot a little bit, um, but ideally you want to get it as tight as possible. You have loose knots, they're gonna you know, slip on you. Uh, these tools make it easier to, to get those knots tight, keep them slim, you know, so they go through your guides. All right, I'll be the first one to tell you, I'm, I, I hate tying these knots on a boat. <laughs> if I can pre-tie the night before or the day before, I will. And I usually bring a backup reel, at least one, because I don't want to waste time during a bite and have to spend it just, a, I mean, it's down to just a few minutes. And I, 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 all of the guys we fish with, whether you, you broke off in the bottom, shark, shark broke you off after it grabbed your tasty critter, uh, whatever it winds up being. Uh, it, it could have been it could have been a, a line fray due to somebody fighting a fish and you guys tangled, crossed over and got cut off under pressure. It's possible. A uh, couple different tools out there. Um, it's an FG. Um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, it'll come to me. I'm sorry. A um, couple different tools out there. Can I tie an FG knot, pulling off the rod tip, winding it by hand? Yes. Have I done that during a hot bite or been distracted or done it at three o'clock in the morning, maybe tied it incorrectly because I couldn't see straight? Most likely. Um, I like using the little tool. The knot comes out perfectly every time. For the PR knot, you have to use the bobbin. It's, it's a must. This is a weighted bobbin. You could actually, uh, it's A weighted and B, you could actually put some tension on it manually with it spring loaded. Uh, got, uh, got the ability to add the tension to it. You want it as, you want the line as tight as you can possibly, or you want the, yes, you want the braid tied as tight as you possibly get it around the mono. Uh, and that, that, dra uh, that friction and tension is, again, what holds that knot together initially. There's a whole debate about gluing at the end for the finish. I like gluing, uh, gluing just a little bit uh, and the reason being, when the line's going through the guides, whether you're casting it out, reeling it in, pulling it under pressure, it's, you hear it dinking through the guides. Well, pick, it's, picture you picking your finger, pick, taking your fingernail and picking that knot with your fingernail. It's the same thing. You're starting to loosen up those fibers. You're starting to loosen up that thread. That's why I like a, just a little tiny bit of super glue at the finish of the knot. Uh, Pluses and minuses with the two. Uh, PR knot is a little larger because literally you're wrapping down over your leader with the diameter of the line and you're winding back up over, uh, over itself to finish it. The FG knot uh, and the PR knot can, everybody says three inches. It doesn't need to be three inches. It could be an inch and a half. No problem. Yeah, now, the FG knot, much smaller, much more compact knot and if you got into the plug, jigging and plugging side of the house and you wanted to do a little more casting, you could cast that FG knot out. Again, remember, as it goes out, as it comes back in, it's picking away at those fibers, inherently loosening those fibers. Learn that from surf casting. <laughs> uh, second little tool you might want, now if you're, if you're tie, uh, tying a knot with gloves on or one hand is gloved, and Benny Ortiz does this a lot, uh, he'll tie one hand gloved and one hand without. He may or may not get a knot, t a knot tensioner out. Now, when I first saw these, I went, wait a minute, you can't pull your knot tight enough together? You gotta use a little thing? <laughs> yeah, after I started doing it, I never- Tried doing it with that real thin line. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> for, all yeah, cut up. your hands are wet. How long have you been fishing? Your hands are wet, you've got all the line cuts already, you've got all the little, the little teeth stabs, the little, uh, the little fin holes and everything you got in your hand from, from that. Now, 
wrap that around your leader and your braid and give it a little snug before you finish the knot, you'll be amazed how much of a difference it makes. Um, Brian, Captain Brian Dietz from over on the East Coast, he entered the competition for uh, strongest knot, str tying the strongest knot, uh, mono or fluoro to super braid. He won. Uh, he won both category with both knots. Both of his knots broke it more than 90%. Now, there used to be a, it's probably still in print, but there used to be a little book that sat on the top of the toilet a tank in the bathroom. It was uh, just a, a book on fishing knots. Anything from, anything from uh, a blood knot to a uni knot to, uh, to a bunch of different things. And I think the most complicated knot at the time was a haywire twist. <laughs> so, uh, we progressed since that with these knots. Uh, with this system, the reason for the, the main reasons for these knots, you want something clean going through the guides. If, the, uh, if, the, uh, if you've got a tag that's too long, it's going gonna, it's gonna to knock the guides on the way out. If you get, it's going to knock the guides on the way in. If the knot's too bulky and you're fighting a fish to the boat, you've got to bend in a rod. That knot might have such a shoulder on it that it actually catches the guide. You go to turn the handle and it just bends the rod over. You didn't gain any line on the fish that's 20 feet there, uh, 20 feet next to the boat. So uh, there's a couple others we can show you real quick. I advise you, uh, again, after being in the Power Pro booth for Shimano, I strongly advise you, and there are a bunch of knots out there where you wind the braid around the mono. The PR knot and the FG, they're different. They're the Chinese finger trap. These other knots where you uh, wrap the braid around the mono are gonna fail. I could break most of them by hand after you tie them. Reason being, when you tied mono knots, blood knots, uh, improved clinch knot, uh, pick your knot, whatever it winds up being. When you snug them up, you're stretching that mono or your fluoro that little bit of stretch creates some friction. That friction is what holds the knot together. Tristan said it earlier, super braids don't stretch. So you could tie a perfect knot and it'll work, but it's gonna loosen up. You give it a little bit of slack tight, slack tight, slack tight, or again, back to the guides, ding, 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 ding. You're pulling that knot apart. Without that little bit of glue, it has no friction to hold itself together. I'll show you, we, we, we could demo these afterwards and I'll show you a cheater knot that you could use speed jigging or bait fishing, you know, just to get yourself back in action. It's a loop with a spider hitch, and then uh, a reverse all bright where I'm, again, I'm tying uh, the fluoro around the loop, so when I tighten it up, I get the friction, it holds together. Uh, some, of these, uh, some of these offshore knots, some of the, and not picking on the California guys, where they wrap, you know, uh, wrap the braid 25 times around, uh, around their leader in a modified all bright, it's not going to hold. It'll hold once, twice. It'll hold. After that, you're, get, you're, you're guessing at best. And I, I, with all the, I mean, just getting where you're going took time, energy, and some sort of value, as in money. And then you get all this value here in the table. You're going to risk it on an improperly tied knot. You're going to risk that one bucket. Maybe that was your only bite. Or was that your bucket fish you've been fishing for hundreds of thousands of hours for to catch? Yeah. Do what you can, but make sure it's the best that you can. Again, no, no one way, no one right way. It all works for you. Um, we're talking leader to terminal. The biggest reason, the biggest reason we want these fine knots, is because of the running guides. These are probably a five millimeter running guide. Most of us, uh, up until this point, unless you're bass fishing, uh, most of us have never used a rod built with such small guides. And the, the reason being, this rod, you want, um, you, this material wants to recoil. It's, re it's recovery. You bend it, and the recovery rate is how fast it comes back to straight. The more weight you put on this, as in the guide system you're using, these are titanium. These are ti titanium silicone. Um, can you use stainless steel? Yes. 
but those stainless steel guides weigh significantly, significantly more than that titanium does. So, back to that whole lever thing, spread that weight along the rod. That weight, you know, think of it as a 13-foot surf rod. You know, how, how many of us have used those giant wire, wire rings that we grew up with back in the, well, oh, shit, back in the 60s and 70s and then even into the 80s? And then we started getting into the ceramic materials as guide rings. And then Fuji came through and used that, uh, the new concept design where that first guide wound up being less than an inch in diameter, but what it did was immediately choke the line down and took all the big loops out of the line so you could cast further. They proposed that to us in the 70s. They had that concept. And we said, no, no, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, short war story. Uh, a brand, uh, a very good friend, Bill Falconer. Uh, Falconer Custom Works, one of the best rod builders I know. I do know a couple of them, I've, I, and each one is a master at his own craft. Amazing. The man is a walking encyclopedia of rod building and fishing. He sent me a micro rod. We've been on this micro rod thing for that shallow water and, and the smaller fish, that first, that first reef drop off. We've been looking for the perfect micro rod. He sends me one, and it was on a rain shadow blank. We were looking for something we could reproduce in the U.S., something, you know, at, to this point, all of these things are designed overseas. The rod design for these things, when we were first trying to figure it out ourselves, we took something that was already here in the U.S., mostly inshore rods or light offshore rods, and we'd cut them and play around with them to see if we'd get the action out of the rods. Couldn't make it work. It's a completely different build. But he sent me that rain shadow blank. Again, the rod only weighed a few ounces. Micro guides, amazing build, beautiful. Snappy, responsive, loved a 60 gram jig. I found the same rod in a custom shop, same exact blank, built with alkanite Fuji guides. Again, I am not busting Fuji and stainless alkanite guides. I've got tons of rods in the house built with them. But for that application, you picked the rod up and you snapped it. It was like a noodle rod. It just, it never stopped moving. Bill's rod, you snapped it and it was just like this. It just, little vibration in the tip and that was it. So when you're picking your rod, pay attention to that. You'll see that same kind of thing. And again, I'm not busting. It's a value rod for the money, but using the, um, using the, using the, the goo fish rod as the example, if they, if they had gone to a lighter, a lighter, smaller guide, those rods would be, yet again, a little more responsive. Yeah, you might not think it makes a big difference, but it, it really, the right components make a big difference on these rods because they're that sensitive. Okay. Again, hang around for a few minutes. We'll, we'll show you each one of these knots. We'll, and we'll answer all the questions. Uh, but for the purposes of this uh, little talk, we're just going to get to that next subject. I take my, well, I'll, from, from my, what I do, take my leader after I tie my knot and I go like this twice and whatever that, it's usually 12 to 15 feet. That's what I do. Some guys do shorter, some guys like to do a lot longer. Uh, speed jigging up north, I was never much more than eight feet. Just a, uh, literally a couple, couple turns on the spool and the jig hanging, out, you know, hanging to the water. Um, real clean water, real clean, clear water with some, maybe some spooky fish. Uh, using again the Northeast as an example, tuna. Fluorocarbon and bluefin tuna go hand in hand. Uh, <clears throat> I've caught my share of fish on mono, I've caught my share of fish on fluoro. It's up to you, figure out what works for you. And the lengths, again, a couple turns on the spool, but depending on what you're doing, uh, getting on, a, let's say, a, a long range boat, a Yankee Caps, I'll do three or four pulls, uh, six foot lengths, give or take. So 24, 26 feet of line as a leader, because A, I know I'm going to be cutting some off during the course, and I'm, I really don't want to stop if we're in a bite, and B, that added extra stretch, the longer it gets, the more stretch you're going to have, uh, that added extra stretch, uh, stretch does add some cushion, shock leader, uh, to, to that whole system, so fish does a sudden little head shake or a uh, your, oh, and or your abrasion resistance when you're down in the bottom. You can wear, you can do a little bit of rubbing with the fluoro in, in, on the structure. The braid and the structure, not so good. Uh, and typically, 
Uh, Tristan, Tritton, eh, yeah, we both start about the same. We, we, we love jigging in that 200, 200 plus foot depth. So 20 feet of line, a little bit of stretch, not a big deal. When you get out a little further or you have a higher current issue, go shorter. And the reason being, you're, you're using that 10 or 15 pound braid to get to the bottom in the deeper water and reduce the amount of drag on the line. Keep that in mind, that long tail of leader with the current is working like the tail of a kite. There's drag and there's, there's, drag and there's resistance on it. Uh, oh, our favorite subject. Yeah. Let's talk about jig selection. Um, you guys said you fish pretty shallow, right? 60 foot, 70 foot, give or take. Okay, what are you guys usually fishing for? Gags, snapper, type of thing? Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Nice. Um, you guys don't have to deal with current much out there, right? Yeah. <laughs> really? In 60 feet? Wow. Okay, yeah. Yeah, been there. Been there. <laughs> been there. It happens, I guess. Well, again, you guys are still a lot luckier than we are on our side. Hey, we got to deal with crazy currents every day. Um, the reason why I asked that is because I want to bring up the jig weight thing. So a general rule of thumb, they say, is a gram per foot of water, gram and a half, give or take. That changes depending on your conditions. Now, where we're at, a gram per foot of water, yes, and it, we're, we're, it can, we, we hope for a gram per foot of water usually. Usually we're fishing a lot heavier. You guys on this side, though, more times than not, at least from my experience from fishing over here a lot, and Derek will know too, he, he fishes over, obviously fishes over here a lot. Um, you guys get away with a lot less. So if you're fishing 200 foot of water, you could probably fish 100 grams over here and get down no problem, be straight up and down, all that type of thing. Um, the other thing where weight comes into, I guess, into play is, I know we talked about scoping out before, we didn't really get into it too much. When we're jigging, when you're jigging, you wanna have as little to no scope as possible. You start scoping out, you wanna reel it up. So this, you know, you kind of have to play around when you're out there, I guess, uh, when you drop that jig down. If you are experiencing a little bit of current and you think you might, you know, you're only getting a couple seconds of bottom time, maybe go up a little bit. So if you're fishing 200 foot and you're fishing that 100 gram, oh, maybe I'll bump up to 120, maybe I'll bump it to 150 grams. And, you know, it's, uh, you'll kind of, like I said, you'll play around with it to kind of get as much bottom time as possible. But again, now that also changes with the type of jig you're going to use. A slimmer jig, you might be able to get away with a lighter jig, but something that's a little bit wider, more leaf style, maybe you have to fish a little bit heavier than you might want to or would have thought you had to because it's going to take a lot longer to get down. It's going to fish a lot slower. Um, this jig here, if I'm fishing 200 foot of water, I might fish either a 200 gram or something, maybe a different style, maybe 240 grams, 250 grams, give or take, just because it's going to fish a little bit slower. Um, <clears throat> so they, they all kind of have their place, um, which we'll get into into the next slide. Unless Did you want to elaborate any of this stuff here? Yeah. So something like this here also, this is kind of like an in-between. So this jig was based off of this jig and what we did, what he did. We shortened it a little bit, wind it out a little bit, and then you get a whole, you know, whole different action from it. And what it does is it makes it a little bit more compact, a little bit more, I guess, how do I say it? Match the hatch style, because this is 230 grams, but the same jig of this, this is the same as that one, it's 240. That's a big difference there, right? Um, so sometimes if you're fishing these, a jig like this, 240 grams, or you want to fish something a little bit smaller, 230 grams will get down, and you'll still be able to fish it somewhat um, in any type of current. Uh, and it might match the hatch a little bit better with, you know, whatever fish you're going after, whether the grouper might be keyed on this snapper. Sometimes it might be keyed on on a bigger bait. It's just, you usually got to play around with it a little bit. Is there a size uh, that just gets too small? Like if we're in 40 feet, are you going smaller and smaller and smaller? So I'm waiting, I mean, I'm waiting, no return, you know? I'm waiting on a bag of jigs. Uh, Bill was just out in Japan and he sent me a bag of jigs in the mail. They're going to be home when I get home later and I can't wait. They're between one and I think eight grams. 
Yeah, when I say mi when I say micro, yeah, we're, we're, you know, some of the stuff the size of your fingernail. I can't wait to get them. And you'll you'll be surprised at what's going to eat them. Yeah. Even, even stuff like this, like you know, obviously everybody's heard that saying, you know, elephants eat peanuts. These fish are the same way. You got a big gag group will eat this all day long. I mean, we've I've traveled the world fishing and jigging, and when I travel, I usually bring my light micro setups, and it's usually the most productive thing I do anywhere I go because it catches everything. It doesn't just um, target big fish, it target everything. So I'll catch all the little species, everything that's colorful, but then you're gonna get those big ones mixed in and I might get smoked a couple times, but I've caught you know, 20 pound fish, 25 pound fish on something like this or something even smaller, you know, that you would never think, but you're in the right place at the right time or maybe that's what they're keyed in on. That's, that's the bait they're eating down there. I caught a red grouper the other day um, back on our side, which is fairly rare. We don't catch a lot of red grouper on the East Coast too much, too often. And I get him up, and he's spitting out, he's spitting out little baits or little uh, squid half the size of this. And I was fishing a jig similar to this, you know. So sometimes it's you got to match the hatch. You don't know what they're eating down there. Usually when you get a fish up, you'll kind of find out. But you know, it's those big fish are gonna eat that small stuff. So touching on what you say. There's really no point to where it's too small because something's going to eat it. Something is. I don't know. It's, something's going to eat that little one or three gram jig, and you'll be surprised. It might be something. I mean, it might be something that's substantial. It's it's weird. <laughs> they're, they're they're small. They're, they're tiny. Uh, that's going to be the challenge because a lot of stuff here it, it it wants to run, it wants to pull, and oh, you got to get it out of the water before the sharks get on it. Um, <laughs> all right. This, I, this is this is my favorite part. Uh, th th this, uh, you, buy the, you buy the rod, you buy the reel, maybe you upgrade the handle on the reel, but go, you know, type in slow pitch jig into Google and, and watch that rabbit hole. Oh. Um, That's why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, I'm getting a little technical. I love designing jigs. I love tinkering. I love playing with stuff. Uh, you take the reel, maybe you can upgrade the drag, the drag washers a little bit. Everybody almost immediately goes and makes the handle a little bit longer, or changes the shape of the handle. Um, line, okay, I bought this from Japan or I got this, it's the latest, greatest thing from uh, Power Pro or whoever your favorite manufacturer is, whatever it winds up being. This is the most fun. And there's so many different little factors that affect the performance on these things. No, so, that's 400 grams. That's 440 grams. Leaf, leaf or plate shaped, um, round, round speed jig for, again, lack of a better, it's a slow pitch jig, uh, but for lack of a better term. Now, each one has its purpose. Uh, again, you guys are spoiled. No current, not much, you know, no current. You can get away with something that swims more now these edges, these edges and sh um, facets, they catch the water. Uh, they're usually very sharp. There's usually some angle on the jig somewhere. I mean, conversely, they could be rounded. But each, each thing does, causes the jig to do something a little bit different. Each one has its purpose. Something like this, the fish are looking for a giant profile. There's, that's a one pound bait. That's your herring, your pogey, uh, your blue runner, whatever it wants. That's a, that's a one pound bait, literally. Um, matching the hatch, they're eating something a little smaller. The cigar minnows are up north, the sand eels. Uh, spearing, what, what do you guys call them down here? White bait? What, 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 uh, shiners? Oh, shiners. Yeah. Or, uh, so, whatever. Yeah. Uh, you're, looking at, you're looking for a smaller profile to match a smaller size bait. Again, First, fish the, fish the weight for the conditions you're in. You're out 300 feet, start off with 300 grams, unless you know for sure there's zero current, and then go to 150. Now, before we get nuts on shape, two basic shapes, fast sinking and swimming. Well, uh, that's what we'll go with. Right. Uh, when you first get into your spot, you don't know what the conditions are. Start off with something that sinks a little faster. Maybe go a little heavier. This is going to be good. 
in free spool, this is going to sink a lot faster than that uh, than that plate jig is going to or that deep is going to sink. Just because it wants to catch the water as it goes down, it's going to flutter. A uh, little bit of a pro tip: if that jig is fluttering too much, you want it to sink a little faster. Actually, feather the spool with your thumb, create a little tension so it can't turn sideways, and it'll continue to fall straighter, and it'll fall faster. Uh, that was a learning curve with the wild. This thing wants to swim the entire way down or the entire way up. Thumb the spool a little bit, just a little tiny bit of tension, and you'll see that thing start to sink a lot faster. Now, again, um, Love that thing. Th this was this was an a this was an I intended to make this, but it was a bit of an accident. Uh, I put a I put a little bit of the shape of a a rec a sea, um, sea floor control rector and a little bit of the shape of the Sea Falcon S Impact into this. Uh, that's not what it looked like originally. I had made a couple of uh, plastic carvings. Uh, I, got, I got to what I thought I wanted, which is a pretty, pretty close to that originally. I made a couple of plastic carvings. I showed them to George. Uh, made lead molds out of them. We tested them. It wasn't what I liked. George took the two best that I had, went back, turned them into a CAD drawing, and then we fooled around with the CAD drawing a little bit. Uh, made, it, made it symmetrical, head on looking at you. Uh, obviously asymmetrical here. For, we, 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 had the, we, we had that little keel design, uh, which lets you add a little more weight into a smaller bait. And originally I intended to fish it like this as a tile fish jig, so the thing shot to the bottom in deep water. Um, I didn't like the way it swam like that. It, it had a tendency to spin. No, don't get me wrong. It still catches. It sinks fast. It still catches. Our heckler in the back of the room, uh, one of his first trips out, they were fishing on this side. They were fishing the wild upside down and knocking the snot out of the gag groupers. And he won't fess up to that. <laughs> nope, not me. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, Fishing it this way is where it came up with its name, the wild. Uh, I turned it around, first drop, I turned it around, literally first drop, 250 feet of water, it hits the bottom. I made one turn, bang, scamp. I'm like, really? Uh, I got six more fish on that drift, nobody else got a bite. Got two more fish on the next drift, and after that, I didn't get another bite because I got bit off by a king mackerel and I didn't have another of that color. <laughs> and it, I mean, look at it, it is, it, 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 it's beautiful, but damn, is it ugly. I wanted to call it the ugly jig. I got overruled. The way it behaved in the water on that pitch when it unloaded, you never knew what it was going to do. It'll, spark, it'll dart up. It falls over. You see it flash side to side, and then it'll dart, and it'll dart. It never reproduces the same action. Uh, like a knuckleball. Uh, like a knuckleball. You, you could throw a thousand of them and they, you, you watch video of those, that, that thousand, one thousand pitches and no two are coming across the plate the same way. And, it, that, and the whole up and down in the air, never the same way. Apps are walking around the boat just to check and see what everybody rigged up with uh, on the way out or, or as, their, as their favorite jig. Now, what I found out from the Japanese, uh, they want something to get to the bottom real quick, narrow design, something round gets to the bottom fast, and it, while they're fishing, they're still, check, they're still testing the conditions. How fast is the boat moving? How responsive are the fish? Uh, this thing has a great sliding action, depending on how you rig it. Um, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, you know, what each type of hook may or may do to your bait. And by bait, I mean jig. Uh, this jig, I'll, throw, I'll, give, I'll, give, um, I'll give Jigging Master the credit where credit's due. One of the best jigs they've made to date is the Gangster Stick. It's also the most copied jig that's out on the market. I don't know how many different people, uh, companies, productions, ways they're reproducing that jig, but VI, um, Gangster, uh, Jigging Master, stopped making that jig. They redesigned it. It fishes well, it catches fish, but it's still not that original gangster design. Um, those long skinny jigs, those are prospecting, prospecting jigs. That's what you want to start with. Check your conditions. You know, drop, drop that 300 and 300 feet, the 300 gram and 300 feet of water. 
If you hit the bottom and you're staying straight up and down for the next couple of minutes, drop down, go to a two, go to a 150, see what it does. If you're not getting bit, change colors. Glows, uh, I love glows, I love pink and glow, uh, the oranges, one of my least favorite and it catches more fish than anything is chartreuse. Um, coming down from Jersey, we fished, we fished dirty water in shallow for the striped bass, the sea bass, chartreuse, you, you didn't leave home without jigs that were chartreuse color. When I got down here, the, the cleaner water, I didn't want anything to do with chartreuse. And then lo and behold, but it works. lo and behold, I'm watching and guys are starting to catch up to me fishing the chartreuse. Like, okay, there's something to that. Uh, use that long, that slim long jig. That's your prospecting jig. Figure out the conditions. You've got no current. Uh, you're not getting the bites on your prospector. And I'll tell you, getting on the boat, uh, Yankee Caps is the example. When we're first getting out to the spot, it's typically the strike, the gangster, and the VIP that you see. Oh, and I'll throw Johnny Jigs in there, one of their long torpedoes. That's typically what you see rigged up. Now, as the day goes on, either you're not getting bit, you're not catching on that color, whatever the reason being, guys start changing jigs. You're still prospecting, but you're going through a different set of shapes. Now, there's a ton of things out there. Some work, some are crazy. Uh, I'll use FCL Labo as an example. If mm -hmm. you, you search those in your, in your uh, Google, they've got some of the craziest designs of the jigs. They work. Now, granted, everything's gonna catch fish at some point in time. You, know, you, you pull up to the spot and the next thing you know, the red snapper, the, the endangered red snapper are trying to eat the motor off the back of the boat. Yeah, I mean, you're, yes, you're gonna catch on them. I mean, are you gonna catch on your, you know, your chunk of hot dog, your strip of bologna? Uh, whatever you wind up throwing in the water, yeah, you'll catch. Have a couple different colors, have a couple different sizes. Um, the black, contrary to popular belief, I've caught more tile fish over 700 feet in depth and more groupers on the black. And typically the black works after 300 feet. You get a little bit of glow, but it's back to, are they seeing it or are they feeling it? Back, back, to that, back to that whole physics thing. Light, light colors or light waves are only penetrating so deep. Uh, after 30 feet, most things, red turns black. Um, after, oh, I, I think after another 100 feet or so, you still might see some fluorescence. Uh, you'll see some shades. Uh, literally, greens, whites, and blues will show up nicely in the deep. Uh, now, then we get into a little bit of uh, artificial light with the glows, giving giving that thing and uh, giving that thing its its own little bioluminescence, if you will. Um, still in the same thought, your your favorite color is your favorite color. Uh, Ray from Ray's Custom Works, he was the first guy bringing in the uh, Sea Falcon uh, jigs. And I, I point blank asked him, hey, what's your favorite color? The open one <laughs> or the rigged one? Okay. Uh, I've, seen, I, I've seen the spectrum of colors work. Uh, everybody knows the fire tiger in fresh water. The guys out in California wanted that for the tuna. Uh, red turns black after 30 feet. That's the custom red that the guys wanted in California for the tuna. Uh, does it work? Absolutely. Have we caught tile fish? Have we caught all sorts of spectrum of fish on this side on those colors? Absolutely. Take, focus more on the shape and what it's doing in the water as opposed to the color. I mean, some, some days they do want a color okay. yeah. and after you lose the two or three you had of those, you don't get another bite. And it, it, now, now you're scratching your head. Did the tide change? What changed? Did they stop eating? Or was I unlucky enough to run out of that last one? When I, when I think of color, you know, when we make these jigs, the colors are for you guys. It's for you guys to go, oh, I like that color. I think it's going to catch. I like that color. I think it's going to catch. It's to catch you guys. What I like to say, there's, there's a few guys I know that design jigs besides Rob. 
And when they're designing these jigs and designing shapes and you know everything they're doing on the water, they're fishing these jigs as bare lead. They have no color on them. They're still catching fish, but they're you know they're fishing bare lead because what's the point? You know they're on the boat. They're you know they might grind a little bit down here. They might shave a little bit off here to get a different shape for it to drop. They're still going to catch fish. So you know he's obviously people that have their favorite colors. Rob has his favorite colors. I'm kind of on the other opposite of it where. For me, color's not a big, big deal. Yeah, that's Rob's favorite color. Pink and white is like, you go on the boat with him, you're gonna see probably 80% of his jigs pink and white. And for me, I'm a little bit opposite. I don't think color matters too, too much just because of what I've learned from the guys that are designing jigs. They're still catching on just a bare jig. So touching on what he said, focus more on the shape, the movement that it gets you, the profile. That's, that's your, your biggest factor in everything, in, in my opinion, on these jigs. Yeah. Grew up working on, grew up fishing party boats and charter boats, and eventually got to the point where I started working the party boats and charter boats. And being a college kid, I had a choice, three choices, and they were tough choices: gas money, beer money, or fishing money. As a college kid, you don't, I mean, you don't have much. I mean, you could sneak back into the house and grab all the food you want, <laughs> and that's one thing. But man, being on the beach, and you, you got to go to cast and you backlash and your jig keeps going and you're, that was your last one. And they were five bucks. Yes, dating myself. Uh, I got onto a charter boat as a mate. Uh, Captain and I were good friends. Uh, I learned a lot from him. Sammy Racino out of Barnegat Light. He's still running the Mary M3. Uh, that boat has killed more fish than anybody could really imagine. Old wooden boat. Um, Jig spins, they say they jig spins. Now, I've really only noticed it big time when you're out fishing super deep water. You guys aren't fishing super deep water, so I wouldn't say you're gonna need it. But if you're gonna go out and fish those tile fish, fish those snowy groupers, something that blows up and they start spinning on the way up, you might wanna fish that ball bearing swivel. It's gonna make a lot of sense. It's gonna keep your line from twisting up and whatnot. Now, that shallow water where you're only fishing 60, 70, 80 feet, it's not going to make a difference. Those fish are going to come up more times than not. They're green. They're not blowing up really much. They're not really spinning around. They're trying to dig back down towards the bottom. So that's where I would say that, it, it, you know, it's not needed it's too, too much. Um, I want to show you. So another thing which I can touch on when, you know, after this real quick, we'll, we'll rig a couple jigs up, but hook length, okay? I see guys that'll fish hooks that are, I've seen it all different ways and they're all gonna catch fish, I'll be quite honest with you. Ideally, this is not the hooks that you're gonna wanna fish on this jig. Ideally, will it catch fish? Of course, but they're a little too short. The size is right. Usually you wanna fit, depending on manufacturer, they're gonna be all different sizes. These are one O's, but then these are uh, Sutekis. If I fish a, a shout hook like that, there's a three O's and they're almost the same size. So like I said, every, every brand's gonna have a different sizing range or you got ours, Jig Pros and these are BKK hooks. You know, that, that's ideally what you wanna see. Um, when you're putting these hooks on, you want them to at least cover, I would say down two thirds of the way, either side. You want them to meet as close as possible in the middle without overlapping on each other because then they're gonna grab each other you're not gonna be able to hook the fish, whatnot. But you also wanna cover as much of the bait as possible so when that jig is falling down, you have hooks. So when this fish comes up and hits it, you know, if you fish too short of a jig, the fish might T-bone it and you might not hook up. You could think you're gonna get a big hit and then all of a sudden there's nothing there. And you come up and you see a big gash in the middle of your jig and like, you fish those hooks that are, you know, the right length for the jig that you're fishing, more times than not, you're gonna get that bite and you're gonna hook up because, you know, the jig was covering enough of that, or the uh, hook was covering enough of that jig. Now for this hook, this jig, these hooks are probably fine. I would fish that with another one on the bottom and they're gonna leave me maybe an inch in the middle, which any fish that I'm fishing for is, their mouth's a lot bigger than an inch. They're gonna grab them hooks at some point. Um, another, I guess, factor of when you're fishing singles versus doubles is maybe out in that deeper water again. Now, when you're out deep, you're fishing, 800 foot, nine, whatever. You want as least amount of chance for you to foul up without half, you know, you want to, when you're dropping down that far, you want to be able to bring a fish back up 
when you're coming up. You don't want to have to come up because your hooks all fouled up on each other, and then you're wondering why everybody around you is getting a bite, you're not getting a bite, and you pull it up, and now you're, you're, you know, your hooks are all grabbed up. Um, fishing those singles kind of keeps that from, I'm not going to say keeps it from not happening because it could still happen, but it also gives you a bigger hook for a better hook set in a bigger fish's mouth. You know, you get it around their jaw. When we're fishing these doubles, the idea is to fish these really light gauge hooks and have four points of pressure on the fish. So when they eat it, maybe one hook gets in their mouth, the other one's grabbing on the other side of the mouth. And now as they're fighting, that jig's swinging around. Now, now you got two hooks that grab the back of him. He's hooked to four spots, he ain't going anywhere. Um, but like I said, with those singles, you might get a better hook set in their jaw because now you're fishing one bigger hook, if that makes sense. Um, like I said, I know Rob likes to fish singles a lot. That's more down his alley as opposed to me, I'm fishing. Fish doubles more than not, unless I'm trying to chase records. That's a whole different ball game that we don't have to talk about today. <laughs> All right. Good news, bad news. Bad news. First? All right. All right. Bad news. We've only got a couple more slides, but this is this is this is part of the meat of what 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 we need to talk about. And I I haven't given my spiel on hooks yet. Good news. Lunch is here. Do you guys want to take a break and have lunch? Up to you guys. You mentioned hooking top versus bottom at one time. Uh, oh, rigging top versus bottom. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, wow, that's one of the old ones. All right. That's uh, OG. So that's that's literally one of the the OGs <laughs> uh, of the deeps. So this jig designed to fish this section. Here's the heavier end. Uh, it's I shouldn't say heavier end. The wider ends down the bottom. It's that's typically the way we're supposed to fish it. Uh, better better example. So I typically eye up, unless it's a squid unless it's a squid painted jig. In which case I is. Well, it depends on the jig. I, I could be technically down here because how, how a jig or a squid's going to fall on a, a fish, uh, eye first, tentacles first, as opposed to when he's trying to get away, uh, and he's boogieing. Uh, turning, the, these are these are three perfect examples. The wild, the deep, and I just mentioned the gangster. The bigger gangsters, uh, you fish them eye up. However. Certain folks have figured out if you fish them eye down, the jig swims completely different and behaves completely differently. Uh, the wild, again, I originally wanted a jig that was going to fall fast in deep water and let me stay on the bottom with all the weight focused on the bottom. Turn it around, it, it catches everything now. <laughs> so it's, again, experiment. There's really no right, there's really no wrong. If it works for you, maybe you wind up being the guy up here giving the spiel next time. You know, it's, it's what do you learn, what do you take away from it when you're on the water? Um, I started, like Tristan said, I started doing the, the Japanese thing with the smaller, lighter hooks, uh, four of them, you know, two top, two bottom, uh, tying them longer just to meet, so the hooks met in the middle of the jig because that's the way the Japanese guys were doing it. And it worked. Our problem was uh, they were fishing for smaller stuff in deeper water. We were fishing for larger, angrier stuff in varied depths. So we started talking about uh, we started talking about singles you, being on top and bottom. And okay, well nobody's really done that. So what happened? We we tried it. Next, and here we are. We're talking about it here in a seminar. Uh, I do like the fact that they typically hook better. And the, the reason I'm saying that is I, I fished on a boat. We were in 560 feet of water out of Hillsborough Inlet. Uh, I dropped a jig. I caught a little snowy. I know that spot. All, all four hooks were in that snowy, but none of them were past the barb. The thing was pocket booked, but none of those barbs were in that fish. Not in the mouth, not in the head, not in the back and skin. And I'm looking at it going, wow. Next drop, I got a little black fin tuna. Same thing. All of those hooks had a grab on the fish, but none of those hooks penetrated. So chances are, if the fish was thrashing a little more, fighting a little harder, took some drag, would those, would those hooks have worked their way in? Probably. Typically with the single hooks, no ifs, ands, or buts. You got the bite, you set the hook, and you're, you're hooked up. I mean, was it perfect? Is it in the skin on the outside of the face? Is it in the skin right inside the mouth? 
or is it behind the bone and locked in, not going anywhere? Um, you know, that earlier picture uh, with the wreck fish, I, I, I went with two pairs of hooks, and the reason being we were in 2,300 feet of water, and I didn't know what was going to bite that jig. So I wanted those hooks swinging around as the jig was swinging, uh, swimming. So if it was a queen snapper, if it was a uh, palm fret, it was uh, a scabbard or fish, you know, or, or one of the snake mackerels that are out there, uh, I wanted to make sure I had, a, I had a good chance, a solid chance. I, know I, wasn't, I, I wasn't fishing for that one large fish. I was fishing for what was out there, what might bite. Um, we're gonna, this, is, this is going to take you down the rabbit hole. Uh, I like the bigger single hooks. And the reason being, I fish heavy drag, and I, I really intend to land whatever critter bites, whether it's the couple pound scamp, the couple pound red snapper, or it's the 45 pound gag. I, I, I don't want any doubt in my mind. And I have a nasty habit uh, of straightening and or breaking hooks. Uh, I've got a collection. I, uh, I shared a picture with these guys from the weekend where I hooked a fish. Uh, it was a small, tasty creature, probably a mangrove, sna mangrove snapper or a little jack. It was, it was bouncing away on the end of the rod tip. I knew, I had an idea of what it was going to be. I thought I got sharked. I got groupered. Uh, I was fishing, thankfully I was fishing the right reel. I had a 500 accurate narrow with 30 pound braid and a 60 pound leader because I, there were just so many sharks there. You had to get your red snapper to the boat or you lost the snapper and the jig. So I lucked out, I hooked that fish on that rod and reel. I was fishing one hook top and bottom. Uh, I'll show you a picture when we, either when we break or when we finish. I, I was into that fish for, I don't know, about 10 minutes. It was definitely give and take. He wasn't, he was given as good as he was getting, but I'd take three, he'd give back six, he'd take back eight, I'd get five. It was just back and forth, back and forth. I wouldn't let him get his head down. I was pulling, literally, rod straight at the fish, just pulling with a lockdown drag. Um, have you felt when you're fighting a grouper, whether either on a, a jig rod with either, either braid or on a bait rod with the mono, and you're cranking that grouper up, and he gets that 35 or 40 feet off the bottom, and then he swims ahead and suddenly slams back down. And that's when most of those fish come unbuttoned, whether it's bait or jig. That's what this fish did. He popped up a little bit, he turned himself over, he got just enough slack so he could turn himself over and slam back down. Those hooks straightened out like you end of nice end, end, end of story, <laughs> and that, that was. I'm gonna say I, I I'm gonna say I was fishing 22 pounds of drag on that because that that was that's one of my, that's one of the the reels I'll put on. If the captain says, "Hey, we're going to this spot," and I've caught these size grouper off of them, I pull that reel out, I put that one on, and that that one's rigged just for that kind of thing. But I, we the sharks were so bad we couldn't get the snappers to the boat. If you fought them for just a minute or two, you lost the fish and the jig. It was game over. So I. Yes, I, I, if you look at my collection, um, I'm, again, this is not picking on anybody. This is just me learning, uh, being out there. This is uh, VMC's 7264. That's a 7.0. That's a 9.0. Uh, older hook, probably 10 years ago, uh, VMC designed it for their speed jig assist hook. Phenomenal hook. I've gone through thousands of them. My buddy builds tackle. Uh, between us, we've probably, he's probably sold 2,000 of them. I've probably used 1,500. I, I still have a half a box at home. I straightened two of those out. And out of the two boxes of hooks, I have one other set of these at home that I straightened out. We were on a grouper wreck out here, and I'm pretty confident I hooked a double amberjack. And just the two of those fish, I couldn't, I couldn't make any line turns on them. But just those two fish slamming around, fighting against each other, straightened out the hooks. So I never reeled up. I'm jig, jig, hooked up, and can't, can't set the hook in the fish. Jig, jig, hook up. Hey, we're going to make a remove and reset. I reeled up. Both of those hooks are straightened out. But the fish we brought to the boat that day, those amberjack were every bit of 60 pounds plus. There, wasn't, there, was, there was no 40s. They were all 60 plus. So it's just one of those things you, you got to... You got to see for yourself. You got to learn. Uh, 
at Jig Pro. We have a couple different singles. Uh, we've been using a, a Southern, this, this is a, this is a knockoff of the Southern tuna hook that Mustad came out with for, for the big, literally the big tunas, uh, bluefin up to thousand pounds. Uh, Gamaga, uh, Gamagatsu had something similar. Uh, I forget the name of it. It's discontinued, but this, this is a, a Chinese manufactured hook. Um, this is made by JKK over in China. Phenomenal single hook. We've got these rigged for sale. Now, you, had, you had a question moments ago about how they're rigged. A prime example of how they're rigged, go ahead, pass these around. Uh, double top, double bottom, split ring to the solid ring on the hooks, and then the swivel on the ring. That's, the, that's a standard technique uh, originally, it was to a solid ring instead of a split ring, but people like the people like the ball bearings or the swivels because they tend to, to twist less. Every now and again, the jigs are going to twist. Uh, deep water, they're prone to twist just because you're sinking, covering such a distance. And then when you hook a fish, typically those fish coming off the bottom, with the resistance, after they're done doing whatever little fighting they're going to do, typically they're going to spin up. Now, I'm not, I'm not really a fan of twisted line, especially after you pay as much money for, for these jigs that we do and or the line that we're using. I hate twists in line. It's not supposed to have twists. The caveat there is, I think, and Tristan will tell you the same thing, I think in the shallower waters, I think going straight to the solid ring and using a solid ring instead of having a swivel lets you put a different action into the jig. Uh, prime and a prime example where it can backfire against you is the Sea Falcon Slow ne Slow Neo, yeah. Slow Neo and Z Slow. So the Z Slow is a word. Do I have no? No, I, I, I made sure I left a lot of that stuff home. <laughs> I don't know uh, there. It's a flatter jig, uh, shaped like a spoon. Uh, for lack of a better term, shaped like a spoon, like you'd fish for redfish out here. The weight, uh, it's, it's a leaf shape with the weight in the front third of it. It falls nice, it's got a flutter, it dives, it swims, it's great. Uh, found out if you put the swivel in front and you either yerk on it for putting some action into it, or you start cranking to get it out of water, it spins like a rooster tail. Fish, for the most part, don't like stuff that spins. So, my, uh, what, what, we're still in this rabbit hole. Take your jigs, go to the dock, go to the pool, go to the river, go somewhere where you can drop them in and bounce them up and down a couple times. Get to learn the action of the jig. Naked, unrigged, see what it does in the water. Watch what it does. Jerk on it, give it a lot of slack, let it swim and do whatever it does. Watch what it does. Then put one hook on it, up front, like a speed jig. Put the second hook on the back. Watch what it does. Watch how it behaves in the water. Watch what the hooks do. You'll see some of that. Um, then, I, I, me personally, I'm not a fan of the crystal flash. Every extra bit of thing you hang off of a jig creates some resistance in the water. In this particular case, in this particular case, again, I, we want to catch the fishermen. We want you to buy it. Now, it's got the crystal on it. It's, go it's beautiful. This does catch fish. We sell, most folks want them already rigged. I don't like them rigged. I don't like them rigged because I don't know what the next condition I'm going to be in uh, or fishing in is, and you can't have a bucket like, this slow down bucket with all these jigs hanging off of it with all the hooks attached to them. You'll, you'll never get, I mean, you'll never get a jig out and watch what happens when you kick the bucket over. Try to untangle that mess. Humble side to side and then slide again and then again, like, like a, a, one of those little leaves, they fall side to side and just flutter through the air. This will do that depending on how you rig it. Extra, and the reason there's only one set of crystal flash on here is two, 
one set per pair, one is naked. Too much crystal flash is going to parachute that jig. Literally, the crystal flash is going to be sticking up like that, and this jig is just going to tumble like that. It actually, it, there's so much resistance, it retards the way the jig falls. Just, it, it literally, for lack of a better term, it parachutes the jig. Now, why is that a, why is that a concern? Why might that be an issue? 700 feet of water on the Yankee caps. You're going over the fish here in a minute. He starts just far enough away so everybody gets either their baits to the bottom or the jig guys get their jigs to the bottom. The guy next to you is fishing lots of foo-foo, lots of tinsel, lots of tassels. You're gonna notice he's probably fishing 100 grams or more heavier than you are to get to the bottom in the same time you are fishing two naked single hooks. Now, is he getting bit? Yeah. Are you both catching fish? Yeah. At the end of the day, working uh, he's working a lot harder because he wanted the foo-foos, and yeah, I call them foo-foos. He wants the foo-foo on the hooks. Do they work sometimes? Yes. On the, on the micro jigs, uh, do you often see a lot of them rigged that way? Um, micro jig specifically, treble hook on the bottom, small single assist off the top with, uh, with the crystal flash. That's a little bit of an Asian thing, but it works. Uh, it's specifically like uh, Indonesia, Indonesia, Malaysia. Uh, they, for whatever reason, they love that system and it, it works. I, I, I can't say it doesn't. If you look at all of our smaller jigs, they all come with a single hook up top uh, rigged that way. And it's, it, the system works. But again, what, mess around with it, play around with it. Go before you spend the time on the water. Watch and see what it does in the shallow so you have a, you really truly have a concept of what it's doing 200 feet below you where you can't see it. And then adjust it. I mean, some days the fish want a much slower presentation. So you could either do that manually yourself by <clears throat> slowing everything down or add some more resistance. Um, the guys in the Maldives, they have zero current in 12 trillion feet of water. <laughs> They all insist on fishing the squid hoochies on their hooks. So every, every, every assist hook has some sort of little squid thingy, little fish thingy, the, the plastic hoochies that we, we troll for kingfish and everything else. Uh, it, it's just, it's a matter of where you live and what the need is. If, if we fished the hoochies on every tilefish jig in the East Coast, we'd probably be up to four pound jigs by now. Yeah. It's just, it, 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 it's, pay, it's, it's very, it's very attention, uh, attention to detail oriented. Um, I found these cool little things from Jigging Master and there's a bunch of different videos on how to fish them. It adds some profile to the jig. Uh, you, you could rig it in front, you could rig it in back, you could rig it with a six foot leader and fish it off the back of a jig as a dropper, just using the jig as a fancy sinker. Uh, some, some days when there's absolutely nothing working, I pull, I'll pull this out and hope for the Hail Mary. But it, it's just, again, make it your own. Um, these, are, uh, these are from the Australian Ocean, company. Ocean Legacy. Ocean Legacy. I bought these. I thought these were going to be great. Uh, for me, too much tassel or too much foo-foo on the hook. Big hook. But again, I wound up, just to get the jig to sink, I wound up having to add 100 grams to it, three ounces. Add that three ounces into fishing for two days straight. <laughs> Adds up quick. All right, break. I got one slide left. You guys want to roll right through it and we'll finish it up. Uh, Colin's hungry. He's, he's, no, I mean, he, he, he did, uh, the food's ready for you all, so I don't know if you all want it. To... Last slide, and we're out of here. La last slide. Yeah, did... Kind of the most important, but let's go over technique, all right? The first thing I'm going to say, you see it up there, is slow down. Everything you know about jigging, which is mostly speed jigging, you want to kind of throw that out the window when you're doing this. Um, you want that jig to go, you want it ideally to move as slow as possible because you're going for those bottom fish that are big and lazy. Those fish don't like to chase much. They want something that's coming straight to them, an easy meal. That's why slow pitch jigging shines so much. Um, let's kind of talk about, I guess, how how to jig, how, how we do this, how we hold the rod and whatnot. Uh, let's grab one of those. So first thing you're gonna know with these rods, 
you got that trigger there. Ideally, you don't want to hold it like that. What I like to do is I'll put my ring finger, or you know, my third finger, on it like that, to where I can have my I'm sorry, I can have my pointer being able to touch the spool, touch the, uh, and then my thumb be able to touch the spool up top here. Next thing, once you get down, or like you said before, when you're dropping down, so make sure your jig drops straight as possible. Keep tension on the line. Keep tension on the spool. You don't want to stop it, obviously, but keep enough to where it's, it's moving pretty quick, but that you don't feel the jig moving on its way down. This is just while you're dropping. Once you hit bottom, all right, you're going to engage your reel. And first thing, how you want to hold it. Let me, let me, you could hold it how you want. I'll put it like that. But if you want to do it the right way, you want to get the most out of this, you want to be able to rest this on your forearm right here. All right, what this allows you to do is get the full range of motion as you're jigging. You put it here, you can only go so far. It's gonna work, but you're not gonna get everything you can out of these jigs. And for something like, you know, something like this, it might be okay. You wanna fish one of, one of these guys, or like the wild, something that's got a lot of hang time, a lot of flutter. You're gonna wanna be able to get as much motion out of that as possible, so you can let that, you know, you give it as much slack as possible to let it do what it needs to do. Um, so, like I said, you're jigging, there's a few things you can do. I'm going to hit bottom. First thing I might do is, depending on how deep I am, if I'm shallow, usually you're pretty right on top of it. If I'm out a little deeper, I might reel up a little quickly just to get the slack out of my line. Once I feel that tension, I'm going to drop back down. Now I know I'm pretty straight up and down with it and, you know, have uh, tension on it. I'm going to start jigging. I might come up, let it go back down. I might work that. I guess yo-yo it, if you will, maybe three times. If I don't get hit on that, now I'll start working the water column a little bit. I might bring it up 15 feet, 20 feet, maybe 25. If I still have enough vertical, you know, still vertical enough, I'm gonna drop back down, I'm gonna work it again. Ideally, when you guys are out there, you guys drifting or do you anchor up? Ideally, you wanna drift, you don't wanna anchor. You can anchor, but you make one drop with the jig and that'll be it because now that fish is done seeing it bounce up and down a bunch of times and they're not interested. You want to be able to cover water with this, so. I see people anchoring because there's just so many boats everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that could be. Last yeah. Saturday, you know, the park at the mall easier. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, you couldn't have drifted. Yeah. Ideally, you want to be drifting with this because, again, you're only going to get, that same fish is going to look at that jig up and down. If they ain't you hit the first time, more times than not, they're going to hit it. They're not going to hit it every time they see it coming up. You want to cover water. Show this jig to different fish. That's like the most important part about this. So you will gonna you are gonna scope out eventually. Um, once you start scoping out, just work it back through the water column. You want to speed it up a little bit and see if you can get a tuna or kingfish or whatever you guys you know whatever's swimming that mid water column, the amberjack. You can get up, drop back down. Another thing you want to do is even if you have no current, try to pitch it up current a little bit because as it's coming down, it's gonna want to scope out a little bit. You pitch that thing up current. By the time you catch up to it you'll be right on top of it which is where you want to be as vertical as possible anything past that now you're working harder to move the jig or you know when you're up and down and you're doing this you're straight up and down you're getting the most out of it if that jig is over there and you're going like this you might be moving it 10 inches if that if you're lucky you're just pulling slack out of the line at that point um another thing i want to touch on is how to fight the fish and this is going to be the most important part of all this you spend all this money on this gear especially this rod you want to be able to fight the fish properly. Now, I told you there's rods that can handle putting it here and doing it. Ideally, you don't want to do that. One, it puts more pressure on you, and you think you're pulling on the fish and getting it up quick. I promise you what I'm about to show you will get the fish's boat way, way quicker. When we hook up, we don't want to, we're not trying to do this. You bring it past that, what, 45 degree angle, you're probably going to break the rod. You're going to hook up, and you're jigging like this, Naturally, when you hook up, all that pressure is going to bring that right to your armpit. That's where you want to fight it. When you're here and you're fighting that fish, point the rod at it. All right? Point the rod. Let the reel do all the work. The rod's done its job. The rod got you hooked up. That's all the rod's there for is to move that jig. Once you're hooked up, now the reel's time. It's, it's time to shine. That's why it's important to have that good drag because, you know, it's, it's taking the beating. So you want, to, you want to point at that fish and straight crank. Let the fish pull if it's gonna pull a little bit. If it's pulling too much, maybe you push it back forward to full, a little, far, a little farther to full. You might be able to use your thumb and your index finger to kind of manipulate the spool a little bit more 
add a little bit extra drag. But if he's going to run, let him do his little running. Try to stop him, but don't yank on him to stop him. Because, you know, if I'm pulling you, you're going to want to go back the other way. And it's the same thing with the fish. You pull on him one way, he's trying to get back the other way. For some reason, when you straight crank a point at him, it's almost like guiding him to the boat. You'll notice the fight is completely different. They don't pull as hard. They might, like again, do the initial run, but once they start coming, it's, they're coming. They're not, you know, more times than not, they're not going to run back down. Sometimes they will, depending on, you know, what kind of fish you got, but ideally point at the rod, point at the fish. Don't put crazy amount of bend in this rod and the fish is kind of naturally just kind of come to the boat and you're not going to have a catastrophic, fish, catastrophic failure. Um, that's kind of, in my opinion, the most important part of it all is how to fight the fish. And that's, again, after you hook up, fighting the fish is what's going to, that's, I don't know. To me, that's what makes it easier. I have more, con I'll put it to you like this. When I hook a big fish with this big grouper, I have more confidence catching it on this than I do with 80-pound braid and 100-pound leader and a big rail rod because you're pulling on that fish and you're just trying to dig back down. It's a totally different fight with this. I, if anything, try pointing at the fish and fishing it that way. It's, it's going to make a world of difference for sure. What do you got? All right. Those are what I would call left-handed reels. Yes. Because we're just used to digging, <laughs> cranking. Uh, but that's... This is a left-handed reel. They make... I fish lefty. Rob fishes righty. Okay. I, totally I, I up to you. Whatever you're comfortable with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've seen people do both. It's, it's I like to have the rod in my dominant hand, and then this one just kind of reels up. You know, right. doesn't give... doesn't have to do much work. Um, that's just me. Other guys like to fish it the other way. It's, I would say try it out because a lot of guys will fish. You'll fish your bottom rods right-handed, but you get you pick up your spinner and you're working a lure or something. Mm -hmm. You want you want to fish it the other way, and that's how I kind of look at this. I'm, I'm dominantly right hand, but I look at it as if I'm fishing a spinner or fishing a lure. I want to have all the control in that dominant hand, and this is just going to, you know, turn the reel for me. Rob does so, a little bit. He, you know, he fishes it the Conventional way. I'll start, way. I'll, I'll start off with that joke. You know, the young bull and the old bull. And I'll, I'll give, if you don't know the joke, I'll give you the full joke at the break because I'm sure YouTube won't like this at all. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I do fish dominant hand. You know, I love pulling on amberjacks. Not necessarily with this, but I, I've got a set of speed jig rods I had <clears> made up by a friend. Um, so, right handed conventional. And then I had a second one made up exactly the same, but as a spinner. So get out on a wreck, pull on a 60 pound plus donkey. And as soon as he gets in the boat, pick up the spinning rod and give, give, this, uh, give this section of the body a, a relax, but start speed jigging with the other side of the body now with the <laughs> spinner. So yeah, while, while you're still huffing and puffing, I'm starting on my second fish already. Because yeah. again, I just want to catch one more than you. I paid all that money to get there. I want to have a good time. So, all right. This is completely different than speed jigging. We're not, we're not, after this rod had, this rod was designed with one purpose and one purpose only, to make that jig dance in the water and get that bite from the fish. After you hook that fish, the rod has done its job. It just sits back and watches your show. That is it. It's now a spectator. At best, you might guide, use it to guide the fish around any tangles or whatnot, boat side, or when you get up to the side of the boat, you kind of got to lead them to a net or lead them to a gaff. That's it. These rods don't want to fight the fish. Um, crack then snap is the next thing you're going to hear if you decide. Uh, and it, it, there's, there's a ton of videos out there. You know, guys, guys popping the rod into the gut and the rod's bent over, and that's the last time you see that rod in one piece. It's, this is not the fun that's not the function. Uh, our Asian friends would actually say that's too much of yeah. a bend in the rod. <laughs> if you see it, here's the butt cap here, and this is bent through. They want it as straight as possible. Now, my little caveat, my little thought, I've done some fly fishing, I don't know about you guys, um, striped bass and that kind of stuff. I typically fight these like a fly rod. So same thing, you got the fly shot with the, with the rod bent over in the giant sea going out to the fish. Improper technique. That rod wasn't meant to do that. All you're doing is you're, now you're, we're back to that leverage thing. He's got nine foot between you, uh, or nine foot of stick bending over between you and him, and nobody's getting anything done. 
proper way to fight the fly rod is you're back here pointing the rod towards the fish, a little bit of an angle, but you're fighting the fish from the meat of the rod back here where it has all of its power. That's my philosophy, that's my concept. So if you see me fighting a fish, I'll, instead of straight down, I'll have a little bit of a bend in this section. And I've actually, I have actually worked one reel seat loose just from bending it, just constantly bending it through the butt and fighting it like a fly rod. It do, it, my philosophy, it does work. But again, what Tristan said, and this is why you really can't use a spinning reel for slow pitch jigging, is once you're hooked up, you've got your hand, the trigger's locked in. Uh, my hands are a little bigger than Tristan's. I mean, uh, it, yeah, I just swallowed that reel. Uh, <laughs> my hands are a little bit bigger, but yeah, uh, I'm wrapped around the trigger. I usually, uh, I'll, depending on the reel, I'll have a finger or two locked in front. And then typically I'm, got, I'm again, big hands, I'm guiding the line with my thumb. Uh, but same thing, you're pointing at the fish and working it too. Now, going back to what we said, there are solid rods out there. There are uh, some, of the, some, of the, some of the more budget friendly rods. Uh, the builds are a little different, the materials are a little different. They let you get away with a little more. Uh, you know, it's uh, budget friendly, maybe beginner kind of thing. Now, the solid rods, they are what they are. Uh, in the market right now, they're advancing. The technology is getting better. Uh, what, what the Hardy Rise rods? They're infamous for the, the uh, their videos where they're beating big fish and actually swinging the fish into the boat using the, the slow pitch jigging rod because they're solid. Will they break? They will. Der <laughs> they will. will they Every break? rod's going to break at some point. No. They, they will. I mean, we like no. to say that nothing will break, but they could bend all they want. Eventually, something. At some point, if you do it the wrong way, it will break. Now, the te the Don't let it scare you, though. The, te you know. the, tech, is, the tech is there. Uh, <laughs> I just got mine, so I'm still babying them. I, 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 I mean, they're beautiful rods. I, 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 don't, I still don't know what they're fully capable of. I literally just got, just got my set to fish. So I, I'm, I'm protecting mine. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to tell you, like you said, we're telling you they are sensitive. Can they take some stuff? They can. But I don't want to sit here and tell you, yeah, you can do this with it and go out there and do it and go, oh, he told me that he could do he that. He said so. Warranty. You know what I'm saying? We're, we're pushing these to the limits just so we can make sure we know what, exactly what they do. And obviously we know what they do. But again, I don't want to tell you guys straight up, yeah, it's, you could do whatever you want with it. It's, it's not true. And I don't want you guys to have a, you know, a break and then be like, yeah, he said that I could do that. No. <laughs> no, I've got a, I got a couple project rods at home. I shouldn't say a couple. There's a pile of them. I've got a couple project rods at home for solid, and that's one of the things I'm doing. I'm 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 gonna try to break the rods. I'm gonna do the pump like a man. See if I can get 90 degrees or better. Uh, George challenged me to break a rod on the boat, and he told me he'd give me 100 bucks if I do it. So that's that's a goal. <laughs> um, but swinging the fish into the boat, yeah, I'm going to do a little bit of that. Uh, again, car doors in 90 degree angles, not so much, but we're going to give it a shot. So looking at the slide, uh, two things I'm going to add to this. We, the, the, the fish fighting is over. Uh, we're done with that, but getting back a little more to the technique. Uh, so from... For traditional technique, slow pitch jerk. You start off with the reel or the rod 90 degrees to yourself. Wind up the slack after you hit the bottom, come tight, get that slack out of the water. Uh, now, you're, now you're fishing. As long, like I said earlier, as long as that rod's in, that jig's in the water, you're fishing. That rod is working. And it literally, the boat's rolling in whatever wake or waves uh, conditions you're in. That jig is moving. We loved going to uh, New England on those party boats for cod and pollock in six to eight foot swells. Not seas, swells. Think about that. Every time the boat goes up, it's, it's eight feet. You know, you're jigging, you don't have to jig as hard. Uh, same thing, after you hook up, the boat's rolling, the boat pulls up, you reel down. The boat's doing all the work for you. Use what you got to your advantage. So. 90 degrees, now, uh, Asian, it's a pitch. Oh, I'm sorry, here it's a pitch, Asian, it's a jerk. That's just the way it translates. Now, 
once one turn of this reel is going to pull 36 inches of line give or take uh, that rod tip is going to slam right down to the jig and it's going to launch that jig up now what happens next is up to you you got one turn on do you want to do another one do you want to do a half do you want to do a quarter figure out what the fish you're looking for um, We've been in conditions where nothing is happening, but the fish are there. And we started, we got down to sixth of a turn. And it literally just snap, snap, snap. And the lane snappers, you'd see it, the rod, you'd let the rod come to a rest, and all of a sudden, dit, 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 and the rod would bend over. The lane snappers were hitting it on the pause. Uh, red groupers are infamous for that. You do some sort of a pitch, some sort of a turn, long fall, whatever it winds up being, and you let it hang. And it's just hanging, it's hanging, you go, it's been too long, and all of a sudden, slam. Red grouper just slams the jig. Why? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I, if I knew, if I could tell you why, uh, if I could tell you why, I wouldn't be on this side of the, on this <laughs> side of the table. Yeah. Um, but for the slow pitch, uh, full turns, quarter turns, work that column. You got your fish finder, it's telling you where the fish are. I mean, are, is there other stuff that's not marked on the screen? Sure. I mean, that's a cone going out of the bottom of the boat, and the deeper it goes, the wider it gets. There's stuff outside of that cone. Um, the pelagics. Who doesn't like pulling on a blackfin tuna or a big kingfish? And then, don't forget, those fish will suspend when they're feeding. I mean, you're in 200 feet of water, but uh, Tristan sent pictures from last weekend. The, uh, the Almacos and the AJs were in 400 feet of water. They were 200 yeah. feet off the bottom. Queen snapper out here in the deep water. Yeah, a lot of times the bait guys are catching yep. them right on the bottom. Red snappers too, same thing, uh, they're usually red snappers. suspended. When they're feeding, they're coming up. Go to northeast, the sea bass, they'll come up off the wreck because they're feeding whatever, whatever it is they're eating. And then typically, the bigger fish are off the bottom, you know, stuff you don't have to measure. Uh, and then the more voracious stuff or the better quality is up off the bottom because they're actively feeding. The smaller stuff doesn't want to get eaten by the bigger stuff, so it's going to stay closer to structure fact of life <laughs> it's nature now uh, long fall so high pitch high pitch is crazy uh high pitch um if you if you google it you'll see it uh it's a little bit different technique you're sticking a rod in, into your belt into your thigh you hit the bottom you make a turn now their technique, I don't really like their technique. It's a, it's a little bit of a drum beat rhythm kind of thing. It's a faster cadence, but literally they're dropping the rod, hitting the gunnel, and snapping up and making one turn. And then dropping again, snapping up and making one turn. Does it catch fish? Yes. I don't, it's not my favorite. I'd rather speed jig if we're doing that. It's just more comfortable. And I, again, I just got that. I'm not smacking it on a rail or the <laughs> gunnel. That's, that's not me. Uh, long fall. Can you long fall with a, with a slow pitch rod? Absolutely. What is it? Long fall, you're reeling down to the fish, down to the water, and you're doing a full sweep with the rod. Again, your rod's under your, uh, under your forearm, not in your armpit, because this is much less movement than this is. Now, cheater, a uh, little bit of a cheater, you get in this video and nowhere else. Uh, Look for the look for the wraps for uh, for golf clubs or tennis uh, tennis rackets. Put some of the wrap on your blank. A, it protects the blank. B, it gives you a little bit of a resistance so it's not slipping off. And C, if your hands are truly wet, you take that that grip material. It's usually a little sticky, even when you're sweaty or wet. If you got to pass the rod around a rail, you've got something positive to grab, th grab a hold of that's not going to slip out of your hands. Uh, protects, from holder, too. protects from the rod holder. Benny is infamous. He uses a little strip of that non-slip material they put on the, the stair treads, on the edge of the treads. Uh, so when you're running down the stairs in an emergency, you got some, you got some traction. He puts a little strip on the blank. Uh, I like the wind grip. A, it's got a little foo-foo color. So I know my rods from everybody else's, and B, like you said, protecting the rod from the rod in the holder, because let's face it, if it's standing vertically and the boat's rolling, what's it doing? It's spinning around, it's rolling, it's wobbling, or uh, if it's in the gunnel on the way out, how many guys have the pins busted out of the bottom of the gunnel for the uh, gimbal? 
So now you drop the rod and it slams down to the real seat. Or uh, how many guys don't put the little uh, plastic insert back in to the rod holder after they pull it out. So now it's rubbing, it's rolling and rubbing in this spot on bare metal. All right, so, uh, sorry, I digress. Important, valuable, <laughs> valuable information, especially when you get into a higher end rod, you wanna protect the thing, it's an investment. So, uh, long fall. So, down to the water, up, and then do you want a yo-yo? Are you fishing for snowies or tilefish? Yeah, you really don't want to recover too much line. You want to continually find bottom and then just keep, keep doing it. But every once in a while, drop back, find bottom. If you're dropping back more line and you're recovered, you're scoping out, watch the angle, excuse me, watch the angle on the rod tip, or watch the angle from the line leaving the rod tip. As soon as it starts to scope, like Tristan said, reel it up and start over. And that's the perfect chance for you to do a little speed jig and looking for the blackfin or whatever's out there. On the long fall, if the fish is suspended, it's a great technique. Let's say that that's what? Four and a half feet, double that, nine feet of swing. Make it half a turn, let it fall, let it come tight. Rinse, lather, repeat, do it again. And then if that doesn't work, speed it up a little bit. Make a few more turns, come up halfway, check that water column out, don't be afraid to explore. A lot of guys, and I've seen this, I don't know how many times, captain says, hey, let's, let's make a move, reel it up. And they just wind in straight. I jig the whole way up. I find that one last oddball bite, the black fin, the king mackerel, or whatever just happened to be coming through the area. Lucky wahoo, cuts you off. Lucky wahoo, <laughs> you know, it's, you keep, as long as the rod is in the water, fish it. I mean, if you're, if you're reeling up in 800 feet of water, no. Jig that first few feet, unless you see something on the scope. Uh, last weekend we were in 800 feet and there was a ton of bait between uh, 650 and 800. Did I work that for a little bit to see if there's something in it? Hopefully a black fin? Yeah, I tired myself out, no, no results. Should have stuck with the tile fish, but I tried. There was bait on the machine, I wanted to find out. Uh, what else? Light oh, micro. Light, light and micro, talk away. That's the fun stuff. So for what you guys are doing for that shallow stuff, that light and micro is kind of going to kind of be right up your alley. Um, I like to fish really light. When I say light and micro, I fish really light. So I'm fishing eight pound braid on here to a 20 pound leader. And I don't know, I've caught a lot of big fish on it. I've caught a lot of fish on it. If you go out there and fish that light micro stuff in that shallow water, which is what this would be ideal for, um, like I said, you, you'll, you're going to catch everything from your mangrove snapper, which in my experience, and I've caught, they're pretty rare to catch on jig, but I've caught quite a few. They like smaller profiles, in my experience. I very rarely have caught them on a, on a regular 200 gram jig or anything like that. When I catch them, it's on something like this. Why? I have no clue, but if I'm going out there targeting them, which is, and you guys are in that 60 to 80, 70 foot range, you're going to have a lot of mangroves in there. I would fish some of these smaller things. Um, the difference with this too is there's two ways, in my opinion, you can fish it. You can do it the traditional slow pitch way, or what I like to do is I'll speed it up a little bit. So I'll, I might, you know, I'm, I'll keep it here and I might, I might rip it a little bit and then I'll get different reactions. And what I've noticed is in that shallow water, even the big fish, but some of the smaller fish will come up off the bottom and chase it and grab it. And that's how I'll get my mangroves, red snap. I mean, red snapper eat everything, so I ain't gonna worry about those. but. Your red snapper and even the red group will come up and hit them too. Um, the way I'll rig these compared to something else. A jig like this, I really see no reason to rig double hooks on both sides. Can you? Yes, I have hooks for them right here that you can do it with that are really small. What I'll usually do is I'll run one single on it because more times than not anything I'm trying to catch with this or anything that I'm going to catch with this is going to it's gonna swallow it more times than not. So um, another thing is, is why I fish that light leader. Don't worry about getting chafed off with the fish that might swallow it. Cause that hook that's there is gonna catch them to the point where this is gonna be out of their mouth and that leader will be away from their mouth. You ain't gonna worry about it. Um, the other cool thing about the micro stuff is that it's a little more forgiving when it comes to scope. Now, ideally, when you're doing the slow pitch part of it, yeah, you want to be up and down with it. But those smaller fish will react to that quicker, you know, 
you know, quicker movement of the jig. And even the big, like I said, the bigger fish too. I've caught a ton of big fish on this. Lost a lot of big fish. Lost a lot of big fish on this. Um, I also fish a really light reel though. So for what you guys are doing, if you're really trying to target like bigger grouper in that shallow water, maybe you want to fish like a 300 size, like what he's fishing on his, or you can bump up to a 500 if you really want to with the heavier line. Because at the end of the day, you're just using this to move that jig. You're not using it to fight the fish. Once you hook up, it's all, you know, you're back pointing at the fish. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is my favorite thing to do. You could do it all day long. All right, it's a lot even easier on your body than any of the other stuff we're doing. And like I said, I've traveled around the world. I bring this everywhere, and this is probably what I catch the majority of my fish on anywhere I go. Um, I know he's been playing a lot, around a lot with that micro stuff, and a lot of guys are just starting to get into it because people aren't convinced. Um, or they, you know, why am I dropping such a small bait? I'm not going to catch anything big. You'll catch big fish. Um, and it's just, you know, it's a different different ball game. A lot of guys aren't trying to target that shallow, shallow water because they don't think anything's there. But dropping those little 25-gram and 30-gram jigs in that first reef that's 30 foot, 40 foot, 50 foot, or out to that, you know, 70, 80 like you guys, you'll be surprised what you're going to catch, and you're going to catch a lot. I mean, I, I fish this all the way out to 500 feet. And... Not that I'm really trying to hit bottom, but on a really nice day, I mean, it, it's more fun than any of the other stuff too. I mean, jigging in general is fun, but when you start hooking up a hammerjack and stuff on something like this, it's it's a blast. I mean, and like I said, it surprises you how big of a fish will eat a bait that small. It just, I don't know, that's kind of my spiel on it, and it might not be super technical about it, but it's my favorite thing to do, so, you know, I, just, I bring it everywhere I go. Um, I don't know if you want to, you got more technical about it, but nah, it's not much. light and micro is kind of, it is what it is. It's, it's not a very technical thing. It's just a little bit different tackles, all, in my opinion. So I'll take a little different spin on that. No, for, I, let, me, let, me, let me give credit where credit's due. That tribute, zero, is to this date. And the best micro rod I've ever fished. It's the best micro rod I've fished. I've, fished. I've, got a lot, <laughs> I've got a lot of prototypes in the house. I've got deep liners. I've got garage noggy. I fished uh, the, the Daiwa Saltigas. I fished some of the high-end Shimano's. I've had access to a lot of that stuff. And I've, uh, I've been involved in some proto testing and design with other companies as well. That Tribute Zero is the finest micro rod I've had in my hands, as far as a slow pitch rod, caveat, that I, I've had the pleasure to fish with. Uh, it excels in that 60 gram range. So, 30 to 90, maybe 120. I, again, I really don't have a ton of experience. I only got to fish it last weekend. But eye-opening, fun, it's a blast. What we tend to forget about. Why are we doing this? Distraction. Get away from the rest of the world. Have a little bit of fun. You know, you remember days going, running down to the pond or the stream and catching the carp and the suckers and a bluegill or catfish, whatever it wound up being you grew up with. What about the kids? You're going grouper fishing or you're trolling for whatever you're trolling for and there's no bites. How long does the attention span of the average kid last these days? It's about that long. <laughs> you go out to that shallow water. Maybe you throw a little bit of chum in the water, get those fish going, and then break out the micro rods. This is a perfect application for a light spinning rod. And okay, fine, micro. What's that mean? It's a light rod. Now, Perfect application, boys, girls, other, the misses, the date, the whatever it winds up being, you want to take somebody out and have, just catch a couple of fish. I mean, that's what we started doing it for, right? Was to catch some, catch a couple of fish. You know, sometimes we get a little carried away with ourselves. I'm going tile fishing. Or I'm going grouper fishing. Uh, New Jersey, we're going 60 miles, we're going for sharks. And we just ran through three acres of busting tuna. <laughs> have some fun with it. it. You don't have to spend a lot of money on the micro. The ultralight rods, uh, look for something, you know, something that, something that handles, uh, something that handles between a half an ounce and an ounce. That puts you at, at a half ounce, I'm sorry, half an ounce and an ounce. That gives you 14 to 28 grams. Or look for a rod that'll handle an ounce. But give that tip a little bit of action. If you pull up the videos, and again, uh, the Indonesian guys love this. The Malaysian guys, there's hours and hours and hours. These guys literally 
charter boat six to eight guys, all fishing ultralights, and they're catching anything from uh, African pompano and small uh, trevelis and all sorts of jacks and in the bottom fish. You don't know what the next bite's gonna be. We've caught parrotfish. We've caught parrotfish. We've caught dog tooth snapper. Uh, we've caught trumpet fish. We've caught all sorts of this stuff in, in that first reef, you know, on, on, on the east side, on that first reef in 30 feet of water fishing a 25 or a 30 gram jig. You don't know what the next bite's gonna be. And then the next, and then unfortunately, the next bite may be a 10 or 12 pound red grouper that was just lurking down there. But you still got a, you still got a shot. It's fun. And go to have the fun. That's what this is really all about. You, you, yes. Are there bragging rights? Do you want to catch the bucket list fish? Absolutely. We're, we're trying to go to we're trying to go to Mississippi next weekend for yellowfin tuna, big fish out over there. But we're bringing the slow pitch jig rods because ten miles past where the where those yellowfin are, uh, there's snowies, uh, barrels. snowies barrels, yellow edge. Uh, all those tasty goodness, oh, and some of the some of the oddball stuff, the uh, the snake mackerel, um, the palm frets, you know, we're right there uh, on that one drop off. We're right there at the edge of their swordfish crowns, so they're catching the uh, the palm frets, the alvanzos, and all that kind of stuff is bycatch. We're going to fish on purpose, but just remember, we're here for the fun. You're looking to get away from the daily life. Uh, I mean. You want to make a career into it? Okay, fine. Again, you do you, boo. I just want to go bend the rod at times. <laughs> so with that, we're hanging around. Uh, we can show you the knots. If you have any questions, we're all ears. We're, we're a captive audience for a little bit. So thank you. We got food for you guys, too. So like yeah. I said, you guys want to go over there and do that. Anybody wants to come back and see the knots and jigs and rigging up and whatnot, we'll be here. Yeah, thanks for coming out. Thanks for taking a Saturday to come see us. I appreciate you guys. We, thank you.